to go now. Um, please take it away. Okay. So hi everyone. So um, let's get started. Um, so my name is Madhusudan, and uh, we have also Aditya Murali. Um, I'm a professor in computer science at the University of Illinois, and Aditya is a PhD student who is graduating uh, this year, and he's actually on the job market, um, if you're looking. Um, so um, our tutorial today is going to be on automated data structure verification using unfoldings and SMT solving, foundations in FO completeness. Um, now, while one of the applications is data structure verification, it's really about um, reasoning with first order logic um, in the context of program verification, and it has other applications as well. Um, and of course, as you may have heard, we got snowed out here in Chicago, and I couldn't make my way to, uh, we couldn't make our way to London um, because of cancellations and so on. Um, so we are sorry for this, and uh, we hope we can still do a reasonable tutorial here. Um, so I'm going to, uh, is the, is the scene, scene, scene transition okay? Is the, is the transition of slides okay? Uh, if not, screen? <laughs> okay. Um, so the work that we're going to present is um, mainly from three references here, um, uh, spanning across um, about eight, uh, six or six years or so. Um, so one is a, a popular paper in 2018, um, called Foundations of Natural Proofs and Quantify Instantiation. And then the second and uh, third are Opsler papers um, um, in 22 and 23, um, called Model Guided Synthesis of Inductive Lemmas and Complete First Order Reasoning for Properties of Functional Programs. We also have a tool called Natural Proofs and Lemma Synthesis tool, and it is uh, there's a GitHub entry for that. So I'd like to first also thank the co uh, collaborators, Christoph Luding at RWTH, Lucas Pena, at, uh, who, is a student, who was a student at UIUC, Ranjit Jala and Ion Blanchard at uh, UIUC as well. Okay, so um, let me first motivate uh, our tutorial. So we need quantified reasoning all the time in verification, in, in deductive verification of programs. Um, so when you have a verification, um, even if you give loop invariants and contracts uh, that are strong enough, verification conditions look at the, uh, the following form. You have a precondition for a basic block um, on a configuration C, and you have a transition that captures the semantics of the basic block that takes C to C prime, and you have a post condition on C prime. Um, so now, in this, uh, in, in programs where uh, configurations um, uh, are unbounded, right? So uh, configurations can be unbounded in programs. Uh, for example, you could have a heap, or you could have data stores that you're uh, manipulating, or arrays and message queues and so on. So the configuration is typically unbounded. So if the precondition needs to talk about an unbounded configuration, you would need some form of quantify, quantification or recursive definition to talk about it. And uh, similarly, the post condition, right? So, so you will need to talk about uh, that. It's also true that specifications are for complex enough programs um, also talk about go state, which can include certain things like sequences or queues, um, uh, et cetera, which track in some sense the specification state. And that itself could have an unbounded um, uh, space, and you would need quantification to talk about that as well. So in essentially all program verification, you would need quantified formulae or recursive definitions to talk about, to, to formulate the verification condition. Um, so notice that the pre and the post are, are on two sides of um, an implication. So if your um, verification, your, your condition is quantified, let's say even universally quantified, um, it implicitly has an existential and a universal quantification. And uh, that makes it very hard to automate. Uh, SMT solvers handle quantifier-free so, um, theories well, 
but um, they're not sophisticated enough to handle quantified theories. Um, so more strictly speaking, they can handle universally quantified VC as well. But if you um, if you have other things, it's going to be hard, right? So and uh, you you will get existential quantification because of the implication. So typical settings uh, where uh, all this is useful, um, essentially all of program verification with rich specifications, but data structures and pointer based heaps is a classic example because data structures are unbounded, like linked lists and trees and so on. Functional programs also are unbounded because you typically will have recursive functions defined on algebraic data types uh, that are unbounded. Uh, distributed systems is another example where you have unbounded processes, unbounded message queues, um, unbounded many processes and queues, and so you would need uh, quantification. And uh, as I said, specification can also have quantifications, like invariance and distributed systems, we'll have to talk about um, a potential queuing of messages or an ideal queuing or some linearization and so on. So this is, um, in my view, a challenge problem in automating verification, um, reasoning with quantification and recursive definitions. Uh, decidable fragments of um, logics are well-engineered in SMT solvers to a large degree. There's, great, there's been great progress, but research is kind of plateaued. I think focus has shifted in SMT competitions to domains like strings, parallel imp implementations, cloud implementations, and so on. But to tackle verification, we really need to reason in logics with quantification and recursive definitions. So one hope when we when when things started out uh, about 15 years back was maybe you know you could have decidable fragments of quantified logics that uh, will suffice for most verification. So the idea was to find decidable fragments and show that that's good enough to for verification and. To, uh, in my, in our opinion, this is um, largely uh, failed. They, that doesn't work. Um, decidable logics uh, are brittle. They have, you know, the more expressive you become, the the logic becomes uh, the, the 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 reasoning becomes extremely hard. Right. So, um, so that's one aspect. And the second aspect is that they just don't get expressive enough. Um, so. So there is a real problem here. Uh, there are some logics which do work reasonably well in practice. And uh, for example, parameterized map update theories uh, supported by Z3 work really well. And they can also support set theory and so on to, uh, to um, quantify free sets, which may look like they have quantification, but these are decidable theories that can handle them well. The array property fragment by Mana and Bradley is another one which is reasonable, but as we will see today, it's also based on quantified instantiation. And there are some decidable fragments of separation logic. So the goals of this tutorial are fairly simple, right? The quick goal of the tutorial is um, to understand how to reason with fragments of quantified first order logic over combinations of theories. So we would like sorts to be um, of various kinds. Uh, it could be uninterpreted sorts, arithmetic, algebraic data types, etc. And we have a very, very simple procedure to do this, right? Called Thrifty S I S M T. This is Thrifty instantiation followed by SMT uh, based quantifier free reasoning. So the idea is to instantiate quantifiers. Um, and then send it to SMT, which handles the quantifier free reasoning. So once you instantiate, the problem um, is a quantifier free formula you get, and you can send that through SMT. And you want thrifty instantiation, um, meaning you don't want to instantiate wildly, right? And the and the um, two things, two logical settings, two two ways we're going to look at this is theory and practice. Um, what we're going to show is that. Um, the thrifty ISMT techniques that are used in practice uh, do re work reasonably well in certain settings, but also those those settings tend to be to have a wonderful theoretical property called FO completeness, uh, which is a theoretical result that 
um, says that the validity, you know, is um, maybe undecidable, but proofs are never missed. Right? So there's a recursively enumerable procedure for validity. And um, in fact, I, the, the, in practice, what is followed is actually an RE procedure for validity. Um, so, so we're going to do this, both things, theory and practice. And in fact, this whole work has been going from practical heuristics that are used you know, in tools to theory. So we are discovering this in some uh, retrospectively, the theory behind these heuristics. Um, so all these techniques we're going to talk about today are already used in practice. Um, but I think uh, what is interesting is that they are also first order complete. Um, in, in terms of applications, we'll show how to use such FO complete reasoning uh, for reasoning with uh, first order logic with recursive definitions in two settings. One is reasoning with programs that ma manipulate pointer based data structures, and then reasoning with functional programs with recursive uh, functions defined over algebraic data types. So the main takeaway which um, for the tutorial is that uh, you, sh you know, this, this idea of using thrifty ISMT for logic problems where it is FO complete seems to work really well in practice. Um, so you should try it. Of course, your mileage will vary based on um, what, what uh, application you tried for, but it could lead to practically effective tools for your setting. So um, I would like to pause for questions uh, all the time. So you can ask me questions anytime. So uh, feel free to do that. OK. So let's look at um, a refresher of computability theory and validity in logic. <clears throat> So a computational problem is just a language of strings, um, L, and the problem is membership given W, uh, which is a string. You asked whether uh, W belongs to L or not. Um, the valid for validity for logics, we the the strings are valid or are for our formulas, and the L is the set of all valid formulas. And given phi, you want to know whether phi is valid. A problem is decidable if there's a Turing machine that halts on every input. It, it must halt, and um, it must uh, declare membership in L correctly. Uh, then the language is said to be decidable. Uh, but there's this notion of recursively enumerable, which you may have seen before uh, a long time back, but you may have forgotten. Uh, but it's going to be very important for us. So a problem is recursively enumerable. If there is a Turing machine that is one way decides it, uh, the language that is given a word W in L, if you give a word W in L, it will halt and say yes, it, uh, that W does belong to L. But if you give something which is, sorry, the second one is a typo, given W is not in L, it need not halt. So if you give something which is not in the language, it need not halt. Or it could halt and say, no, it does not belong. Right, but there is no termination guarantee for words that are not in the language. So if you look at uh, checking whether a C program terminates on a particular input, right, that's of course undecidable. Um, it's a halting problem. Checking whether a C program terminates on all inputs is not just un uh, undecidable, but it's not even RE. But as the, if you have a C program on a particular input, it is an RE because you could just simulate the C program. And if it halts, you say halt and say yes. If it doesn't halt, you also don't halt and you keep on going, right? So that is an RE problem. The first is an RE problem, but checking whether C program terminates on all inputs is not even an RE problem. Now in logic, RE is synonymous with every valid theorem having a proof in some sense because if there is a proof, a proof is a syntactic object, which is typically checkable. Um, so then if every theorem has a proof, you can after all have a Turing machine that enumerates all proofs and checks whether anything proves the theorem. And so we can uh, just systematically search for a proof. And if we find one, we prove it. Otherwise, we keep on going forever. So RE is very synonymous uh, with, um, with uh, theorems having proofs at all, right? 
Uh, so with this background, you would you would now uh, uh, understand that Gödel's incompleteness theorem, uh, which says validity of um, is is really saying that validity of arithmetic of first order logic over uh, addition and multiplication uh, is not RE, because if there were there is no proof system for uh, uh, no complete proof system uh, for it, and um, that. And if they, if there were as a complete proof system, it'll not be RE. And the other way is also true, by the way. So it's Gödel's complete incompleteness theorem can really be seen as showing that something is not recursively enumerable. Program verification: Does the program satisfy its assertions on all inputs? Is also not RE. Uh, it's not an RE problem. You may try to um, you know solve it using invariance and hoard logic and so on, but there is no guarantee that there's a proof. For every program, and it's not RE. Okay. Okay. So, um, so what we are going to look at uh, in the the logic setup for this uh, tutorial is going to be a multi-sorted logic. So you have um, multiple sorts, uh, S zero through S n. The and you have a signature that, um, and we have a typed signature. So every function you, you should declare. And, and relation, you should declare the types for it. Um, now we will look at theories over these sorts um, where you we want a combination of theories. So we are given a theory THI for uh, over sigma i, where um, sigma i is sigma restricted to constants, functions, and relations that are entirely within the sort S, right? So uh, sort SI. So for every sort you have Functions, relations, uh, and constants that are within that within that sort only, which involve only that sort, and you have a theory for that. And you also have a theory um, th, which um, involves the theory for all the um, mixed sorts. So if you have two different sorts of um, the functions and relations that are um, over mixed sorts, you have a different another theory for that. So you have this combination of n plus one theories, right? Uh, theory i for each sort, as well as a combination um, as, as a mixed sort theory. Um, a theory is just, um, you know, entailment closed set of sentences. Um, and uh, we will, you know, we will assume it's a recurse, you know, you, you, for, for all practical purposes, we'll assume that there's a recursive set of axioms um, that capture the theory. Which means a set of recursive set of axioms such that the entailment closure of those axioms is your theory. So, for example, Pressburg arithmetic is a theory, and uninterpreted function or theory of equality is also a theory. Uh, we'll also, without uh, loss of generality, assume equality is always present. Equality is interpreted the usual way as true equality, uh, or you can axiomatize it as a congruence um, in the setting. So the problem we're interested in is the validity problem. You're given a formula phi and asked whether phi, um, under these theories is phi valid, um, which in, which means um, or does every model that satisfy the the all the, the the theory restrictions, right? Take any model, does it also satisfy phi? Now, Gödel's completeness theorem immediately tells us that the validity problem, uh, this is the completeness theorem, not the incompleteness one. Gödel's completeness theorem says that this is always provable. There's a proof system which does it, and therefore it's recursively enumerable. So it says that the validity problem is, in fact, recursively enumerable. Every theorem has a proof from the axioms um, uh, that, that um, make up the theory, the background theory. You can, you can prove every theorem. Um, so, um, and validity is, of course, undecidable in every setting we will look at. Even if you have uninterpreted functions uh, for quantified logics, it's undecidable. That's the Church-Turing theorem. Um, so you cannot hope for decidability, but only for RE. So uh, again, some logic basics, we will assume that throughout you can work we can work with purely existential formulas for validity and this is because um, you might have heard of scolarization um, but there's this dual uh, procedure for um, 
called herbrandization. So what you do is if you are given a formula, you can just think of the, um, you can negate it. Uh, you can scolomize that. Scolomization means if you have free variables um, uh, or quantified variables which are on the outside, you could just treat them as constant symbols. And then if you have um, existential quantification, you can, um, which has quanti universal quantification before that, you can uh, scol use column functions to, like a new function symbol F to capture uh, this existence um, using this F, right? And um, you can rewrite it without the existential quantifier. And then finally, you can negate it back and get a pure existential form. So um, you can also put this in pre-next form where all the existential quantifiers appear in the front. So we can assume that all our formulas of the form, they exist x1 through xn such that phi holds. We can do that and we'll assume that that's the form we have. Um, all the procedures that we're gonna talk about today are based on refutation. So the idea is that if you're given a theorem to prove, um, like there exists x1 through xn, phi holds is valid, um, then you would actually show that the negation, sorry, that should be not phi there, of course, for all x1 through xn not phi is not satisfiable. Um, so um, we're going to use satisfiability procedures to show validity. So what we really want is unsatisfiability. We want to show that the universally quantified formula is not satisfiable. And validity is in RE, as I said, by good theorem. So unsatisfiability is RE. And satisfiability is not in RE for most of the cases. OK, so uh, I want to briefly describe where quantify instantiation comes in. Uh, one way to look at this is through Herbrand's theorem. So Herbrand's theorem says that uh, if I have a universal sentence for all x1 through xn phi, and I'm looking to show it's unsatisfiable or satisfiable, um, Herbrand's theorem says that if at all there's going to be a model for this sentence, there will be a Herbrand model for it, where a Herbrand model is basically the universe is made up of terms, ground terms, in your in your in your logic, so um, more generally, it's actually equivalence classes of ground terms. Um, so you can there, there are no no unlabelable elements in your in your in your universe. Everything is just a term, right? So um, so you could have uh, equivalence classes of terms like C, G of C, F of G of C. That could be that equivalence class can be one element in your universe. Right? And you can always construct a model with that as a universe. Um, relations can be arbitrary, but functions are actually already defined in this, in this model. When you apply F to uh, an equivalence class of terms uh, that contain T, it will take you to the equivalence class containing F of T. So the functions have a unique interpretation in a Herbert model, but relations are arbitrary. Right. So the, 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 the intuitive thing here is that you can always assume for universal sentences that your universe is, you know, essentially ground terms. There are not, there's nothing else. So if for all x1 through xn, phi is unsatisfiable in a particular model like this, in, in a particular model, it must not hold for certain terms, certain ground terms, right? And in also by compactness theorem, it's easy to see that there must be a finite set of ground terms that invalidate all models if the formula is unsatisfiable, right? So if the formula is unsatisfiable, there must be an instantiation of this x1 through xn to ground terms, a finite number of instantiations, which already shows that the formula is unsatisfiable. So this is actually the procedure Gilmore did in 1960 for pure first-order logic, no background theories. Uh, you consider a universal sentence to check unsatisfiability. Uh, you can enumerate all ground terms in some order, right? You can say depth D ground terms uh, is the Dth level here. So you, you enumerate ground terms in some order. And in each round, you, you instantiate the ground terms 
to TI. And once you instantiate, it turns out that the problem is decidable because it's just uninterpreted function theory, which we know uh, even SMT solvers support it. But uh, uninterpreted functions are, uh, the theory of equality is decidable, just using congruence closures. And so you can, you can actually decide this. And if not, you move to a larger set of terms. And in fact, he tried to uh, implement this procedure. Uh, he didn't have this congruence closure-based algorithm, so actually he reduced it to Boolean satisfiability and used Boolean solvers. It worked terribly, it did not really work. Um, but that was the first attempt to kind of um, um, build um, uh, an RE procedure for first order logic. And Gilmore's procedure also extends to theory. So if you have a universal sentence under some axioms A, all you have to do is do the same kind of ground term instantiations, but you have to also cover all axioms. So you might have an infinite set of axioms, so you must dovetail between them so that you have, you're covering all axioms and all ground terms uh, at every point. Uh, eventually, you're, you're covering all of them, right? And so you, you, can, you can do such, a, such an enumeration, and you could actually um, uh, show that this is a recursively enumerable procedure. And it's actually an alternative proof of Gödel's strong completeness theorem which says that every theorem has a proof, right? You, you can actually uh, show that first order of validity is RE, but this is actually an RE procedure for it. So this is the foundations of why uh, term instantiation is a, is a tactic for proving theorems. Now, in our world, we are trying to combine theories, right? Combining quantifier free theories, uh, you might know an Nelson Open theorem, so the, the combining quantifier free theories, there's a lot of progress and there's a lot of nice things that happen when you combine quantifier free theories. But qu combining quantified theories is extremely hard. And um, so uh, Nelson Open works only for quantifier free theories. Uh, um, so quantified theories are extremely hard to just combine. So um, I want to give you some examples to tell you why this, because this a lot of weird things happen. Um, so consider A1 as a set of axioms that capture a particular class of intended models, I1. All right, and in fact, it have, captures it exactly, right? In the sense of the theory of A1, the set of all, uh, the entailment closure of A1 is exactly I1. It's exactly the set of intended structures that you want. For example, if you have Pressburg arithmetic, that's a great example where the axioms of Pressburg arithmetic capture precisely the theorems of natural numbers. Now, there can be non-standard models for any set of axioms, which may not be your intended model, but they don't matter so much because the non-standard models have the same theorems true about them as the standard model has. So for example, if there could be a non-standard model of arithmetic, uh, of Pressburg arithmetic, where you have the normal Pressburg arithmetic of zero, one, two, three, uh, depicted in the picture there. You have that omega line of natural numbers, and then you could follow it up by another omega line of integers, for example. And that's a non-standard model but it doesn't matter because all first order theorems that are true in this non-standard model are also true in the natural uh, intended model of arithmetic. So it doesn't really matter whether you have this model or not. And these models are not avoidable uh, in logic because uh, of various uh, fun, fun, fundamental theorems. You really cannot avoid this. You will have non-standard models, but, where, but they typically will agree with your standard models and there's no problem when you, uh, when you have this. Now let's take A2 over sigma 2, which is a different signature, which ca captures another class of intended models, I2. Now when you combine these, these theories, A1 and A2, you would think that it'll capture your intended models, I1, you, you know, union I2. So where models are, uh, you know, if you restrict, so these are uh, separate signatures. So if you take a model which when restricted to sigma one is, uh, is an I1, and if it's sigma restricted to sigma two, it's an I2. Those are the only models that you'll get. That's what you'd expect, but that's not true, right? 
you, it, uh, A1 union A2 may not be in fact a complete theorem. It, it may not have certain theorems, even if your individual models were complete in the sense they were negation complete. Um, even then, this may not be, uh, it, it may not be complete. And the reason is very subtle. It's that non-standard models of each class can interact to produce unintended models that actually satisfy different classes of theorems, right? And so it can make one of the theorems about your intended class not hold because of this non-standard model. So let's look at an example. Uh, if you have A1 as Pressburg arithmetic, it's a complete set of axioms that captures um, theorems of natural numbers with addition only. And let's say A2 is just uninterpreted function theory, which is just all models where functions behave as functions, right? Um, now, the intended combined model will be natural numbers where functions are defined over them. That's the natural intended model that we as humans have, right? That's the intended model. But A1 union A2 may not capture that. So remember that non-standard model that I described where you have natural numbers followed by a set of integers? That can cause problems now because you have added uninterpreted functions to it. So for example, let's take this theorem which we think is a theorem in arithmetic, if I say f of zero is zero, and for every x, f of x plus one is f of x, then we would say, of course, you know, f of x is always zero, right? And so if I said there exists a y such that f of y equal to phi, you will say that's nonsense. There's no way uh, arithmetic satisfies that. But it turns out that you cannot prove that from A1 and A2, because A1 and A2 admit this non-standard model where the natural numbers, the first in prefix of natural numbers, you do map it to zero, right? You map all the elements to zero, but then this integers, you can map it to five, right? You have to map all of them to five. Um, but, but that model will satisfy this formula that there exists a Y such that F of Y equal to five. So when you combine theories, weird things happen. So it, it turns out that Pressburger Arithmetic with functions, you cannot even prove theorems about it, right? Like this theorem, you cannot prove it using the axioms of Pressburger arithmetic and function uh, equality of functions, which is very strange, right? So you cannot prove this. So, um, uh, so, so that, um, I, I want to move on from that subtlety and more towards what we can do, right? Which is what the tutorial is about. Uh, we are going to assume that the quantifier-free fragments um, are um, decidable using SMT. So we want to deal with the complexity that quantification causes. So the quantifier-free satisfiability is actually decidable, is what we'll assume. So if you take the underlying theories, um, uh, the quantifier-free theory is, un uh, is uh, assumed to be decidable. And... Um, even when um, uh, you you have this, so um, so this is a this is a natural assumption, right? Because you can do lots of theories. So um, Nelson Open tells you you can combine such theories as well, and therefore you have uh, Pressburg arithmetic or natural numbers with addition, uh, rationals, reals, um, uninterpreted functions, uh, algebraic data types. The combination of them do have quantifier free satisfiability being decidable. So we'll assume uh, those. So now what is our procedure? This is the very simple procedure for uh, ISM, uh, called ISMT, uh, where given a formula for all X1 through Xn phi, remember we are trying to show it's unsatisfiable. We are going to just enumerate ground terms, T0, T1, and so on, sets of ground terms. Each of these sets are finite. So when you instantiate um, phi using the, um, these ground terms, you will get a finite formula. So you instantiate it using terms in TI, and you, you, that makes, gives a quantifier free formula. We assume that that is, can be done using SMT. So you send it to an SMT solver and check whether the conjunction is uh, satisfiable. If it says unsatisfiable, we are done because... <coughs> We had to show for every x1 through xn phi is unsatisfiable. But if you substituted certain terms and already unsatisfiable, then the, clearly the entire thing is unsatisfiable. And so we have proved validity of the original theorem 
and we are done. Um, if not, we have to uh, instantiate, instantiate with more terms, right? So this is this ISMT procedure. It's extremely simple. Just instantiate using ground terms, send it to an SMT solver. The subtlety here is that you want thrifty instantiation. So you want to choose these TIs very carefully so that they, A, they grow slowly, and also they are not all terms. They are not, in, in, in both contexts, they will not exhaustively do all ground terms, um, but uh, they do it in a, in a much more controlled way. And yet you preserve completeness that you will never miss a proof. So here's a simple example of ISMT. So let's say I had this, these definitions um, for reasoning with, let's say, list, list segments. I have a, a definition of list segment using if and only if. It turns out that this is not accurate enough to capture list segments because you need least, fi least fixed points. But never mind, I just have this definition. L seg XY is true. If X is equal to Y, then it's true. Otherwise, L seg of next of X to Y. That is one uh, definition, which is L seg. It's L seg is an uninterpreted function, which I'm trying to define here what it should be. And then I have LS length, which is the length of the list segment. I'll say if it's a list segment, uh, if, uh, only if it's a list segment, then if X is equal to Y, then it's zero. Otherwise, one plus list, uh, the length of the tail. Uh, if it's not a list segment at all, then I'll say, just say it's zero, for example. And so I have these two definitions, and then I say if L seg S to T holds, and S is not nil, and S is not equal to T, and S prime is next of S, so S prime is just the next element in the list, then I want to show L seg of S prime T holds. Okay, this is a common thing that you have to do, is that if S to T is a list segment, then is S prime to T a list segment? Of course it is. And how do you prove this? It's very simple. Um, you just instantiate these formulas on ground terms. And in particular, let's say, let's just instantiate on S and T. Um, so L seg of S of T is this definition. L, as, as length of uh, S T is this definition, right? And I uh, now I have a quantifier free formula. I've removed all the quantification by instantiation. And I just send this to an SMT solver. And the SMT solver will be able to prove this. Um, you can we can reason with this. It's very simple. Uh, uh, quantifier free reasoning tells you that this theorem must hold, right? So when you send it to an SMT solver, the L seg and L S len are treated as uninterpreted functions, so they're not um, uh, they don't have definitions. Um, but even with uninterpreted functions, this this theorem holds, and therefore the, the, it's unsatisfiable. And therefore, the uh, the theorem that we want to prove is uh, holds. Okay, so I hope that's clear. ISMT is a super simple technique that just instantiates and sends to an SMT solver. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, so uh, here are the main results that we want to look at in this tutorial is that we have two fragments where we have two different forms of instantiations, uh, thrifty instantiations, that are actually complete for this fragment and also capture what exactly tools do uh, in certain domains, right? So fragment one is a fragment where this foreground sort, we have this special S0 sort, uh, which is a foreground sort, and that foreground sort is uninterpreted. So it allows you to model heaps, uh, lo locations and uh, heap structures. Um, and uh, the other sorts can be any theories like arithmetic and so on. The quantification is restricted to the foreground sort and the logic is also restricted in certain ways. But it turns out that that's all that you need to capture data structures, uh, verification, and it turns out that this fragment is actually complete with ISMT. So if you did this blind instantiation followed by uh, SMT, um, even using thrifty instantiations, we look at the, the, the it's complete. So you, the, the, the procedure is complete. So I must, I must say that ISMT in general is not complete, right? Um, you have to choose your fragment well 
for this instantiation instantiation plus SMT to be a to be complete, right? And you need uh, so we have identified two fragments. The second fragment is the foreground sort is an algebraic data type sort, um, and the theory is otherwise um, un uninterpreted function theory, right? The, the 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 mixed sort is uninterpreted functions, and each of these uh, other sorts can be any arbitrary theory supported by SMT. And quantification allows only for definitions of terminating recursive functions. So these are typical in functional programming. You will have terminating recursive functions. So, um, and, and here you're not restricted to the foreground sort. So you can quantify over integers as well and so on. And um, still we have a completeness theorem, right? Uh, that ISMT is complete for both fragments. Um, so it's an RE procedure on valid formulas. For if you are within these uh, fragments, it will, the, the procedure will halt and say yes. Okay. Those are the two main results. Now, the applications of these uh, from which we have, you know, uh, as I said, this is practice to theory. These were actually followed in practical tools and we have uh, found them to be as a, um, FO complete. Fragment one is very useful to model heaps and um, programs that manipulate heap data structures. Um, you can model using the foreground sort a set of locations and pointers are just uninterpreted unary functions in the foreground sort. And then you can define recursive definitions like lists and list segments like we saw using, um, but these require least fixed point definitions. Um, and first order logic is actually not enough. So, and we are not going to look uh, first order logic with least fixed point is actually inherently incomplete. You cannot build RE procedures for them. So we're going to abstract them into first order logic and we'll, uh, Aditya will cover how we do that. Uh, but essentially it's about taking least fixed point definitions and interpreting them as fixed point definitions. And then if you do ISMT, it is actually complete for the, the first order abstraction of it is actually complete. So this is also what tools do. So the tools are um, like a, a liquid Haskell, sorry, um, uh, natural proofs and so on. Uh, when they deal with um, um, separation logic converted to first order logic, they essentially do this kind of reasoning. Um, and so they actually fo follow this complete paradigm. The second one is, um, for functional programs, the second fragment is useful uh, to model functional programs. Um, sound, um, so you get a sound but complete reasoning under theories, and this is in fact the heuristic found in Liquid Haskell as well as Leon and Stainless for Scala. And also functional subsets of Daphne do essentially this uh, technique for um, solving things automatically. Um, now, in this, there is still a gap between first order logic over theories and what we really want to do. And uh, as we saw before, the intended you get these non unintended models um, because of non standard models uh, combining to give you unintended models. So that is a problem. And these are uh, in both cases, we need user supplied lemmas to get over them. But as far as the first order logic fragment uh, that is uh, formalized is concerned, these two uh, are still complete, right? So the ISMT will prove all valid theorems. So I want to, um, so Aditya is going to talk about this in the second part of this lecture, of this uh, of the tutorial. Um, he's going to go into the details of the two fragments, but I want to tell you a little bit more about why these techniques are interesting. Um, so, and answer common concerns that people have raised or in the past. So one is, you must realize that these are actually practice to theory kind of um, uh, results. So we are really formalizing heuristics that already exist in practice and they work amazingly well in those settings, right? Uh, modulo, you know, there might be issues of scalability, but usually, the anecdotal evidence is that it always works. You know, there's there's, there's no problem, um, and that is because and, and I think uh, this FO completeness shows why it really works in practice. Um, 
so these tools um, actually really do only first order reasoning, um, as I said. Uh, they use essentially instantiation followed by SMT. And the heuristics were never imagined to be complete in any sense, but they do turn out to be actually complete. Uh, then there's growing, growing evidence that these ISMT techniques, when properly engineered, of course, can scale in practice. So, yeah, was that a question? Okay. Okay, second, why are these techniques interesting from a theoretical perspective is that as I said, combinations of theories is extremely hard, but we are combining theories here, right? In these fragments, we are combining theories not only for, you know, showing an RE procedure, but in the Nelson Open style, where we are using black box SMT solving or some solving solvers for individual theories and solving that using them, right? Um, so, we let SMT solvers solve each theory in the best way possible. And it's just a black box, right? So um, you don't need to know how it works. And, and SMT solvers work for different theories very differently, right? For example, if you had rationals, the you know, uh, SMT solver may use linear programming to do that. And that's a very different uh, mechanism than most logic uh, proofs that we are used to. So uh, by utilizing SMT solvers, um, uh, uh, that are particular for theories, we tap into the power of SMT solvers, right, of scaling, and um, uh, and yet do quantified combinations of theories. And this is extremely hard, right? Uh, so it's kind of amazing that it actually works in this setting. So in particular, black box combination of theories is even harder, and no Nelson Open-like results are known otherwise, as far as I know. Um, combination of theories can even become undecidable if you if you combine them. So Nelson Open uh, shows that decidability is preserved if you combine decidable theories. But as if you dis combine quantified decidable theories, it can become undecidable. For example, if you have Pressburger arithmetic and uninterpreted functions, both are even quantified versions are decidable, but the combination is actually undecidable. And you can easily uh, simulate a two-counter two Turing machine um, non-halting problem to show that that theory is actually undecidable. <clears throat> so if you, we are combining theories which admit these non-standard models. If you actually wanted to combine the intended model, it is even harder. Right, so if you have natural numbers and uninterpreted functions, if you combine them, as we said, the theory is not even RE. So not every theorem does not even have a proof, right? And yet, in our setting, we are combining uninterpreted functions and natural numbers by combining the axioms, the axiomatic theory that underlies each one of them, right? And you have to make that. You cannot say I I want only my intended model. You have to admit these non-standard models because if you don't you're not going to get completeness in any way. And the reason why uninterpreted functions with the intended model of natural numbers is uh, incomplete is that you can simply define multiplication, right, using uninterpreted functions. You can say, uh, you can just build it recursively. You can, you can, uh, you can define multiplication. So, and validity of uh, natural numbers with multiplication uh, thrown in, uh, addition and multiplication thrown in is not RE, by Goodell's incompleteness theorem. The third reason is that we are looking at very thrifty instantiations. SMT solvers do do quantify instantiation. And as I said, Gilmore st uh, started this work with, you know, um, in the 60s, but it does, Gilmore's procedure is not what we're doing. We're not saying instantiate every term of every sort. That mm -hmm. is not on scale, right? Um, and SMT solvers, like in, in, even um, tactics like MBQI, model-based quantified instantiation, try to look for some subset, but they are not complete. So they can easily miss proofs, right? And um, um, what the theory says is that you have to, if you instantiate every term, like, you know, every constant integer, everything, um, uh, eight, three, seven, four times X, you have to instantiate everything in order to get completeness. And that's not what we're doing. Right? We are doing a much more thrifty instantiation and showing completeness with respect to that. 
So this is not at all what SMT solvers do when they solve quantified problems. So one common question we get is, FO is FO completeness really important in practice, right? So, you know, maybe I'll just work with heuristics and I'll, I'll just get, get by. Um, so I'm, I'm reminded of this Breaking Bad quote, right? So, um, but do you really want to live in a world where of, of, of fragile and clumsy heuristics, which have no theoretical um, basis? Um, um, I think FO complete is a very useful property. First, theoretically, it shows pro proofs are never missed. So there's no go not going to be this embarrassing example ever, right? So it's not going to be the, the, a simple theorem that you can prove that this thing will not prove. Um, that just simply will not exist, right? And in practice, uh, what we have found, at least in these two applications, is that a small depth of instantiation always seems to suffice. So anecdotally, you know, you just need depth two or three, and you never go beyond that. Beyond that, you start suspecting that your, your theorem is usually not valid, and in fact, it's not uh, typically not valid if, if you go beyond depth two or three. So there is this dichotomy. What we have noticed is that in situations where FO completeness does not exist, like for your like arbitrary first order logic, like um, arrays and general for, uh, or MB, uh, MBQI or whatever, if you just do that, quantifying instantiation is not a great heuristic, right? It does not that it anecdotally works really well. It does not work well. I mean, people who do quantify instantiation to do this will tell you that it just not it does not work, right? But in situations where FO completeness holds, it seems to work really well, right? And we have some growing evidence of uh, tools based on this where they really work. So maybe FO completeness is the key, right? Is that it is it exactly captures uh, when quantified instantiation is going to work. Uh, so I would not use quantified instantiation for general arrays and so on. I I, do, I would not use the techniques and giving for arrays because it's not complete and it's, uh, it, typically it will not work. The other question that we commonly get asked is what do we, what do, we do if formulas are invalid? I mean, maybe uh, you're given an invalid formula, you're going to run forever, you know, what is the use of that? How are you going to discover? If it's valid, okay, somehow you do prove it. If it's invalid, what are you going to do? Yes, I mean, this is a problem, right? Uh, when you're in program verification, you do write things sometimes which are invalid, and um, uh, it is a problem. But remember that this problem is undecidable. We cannot do both both these things uh, using RE procedures. But handling uh, valid formulas um, is a big deal by itself first, right? Uh, invalidity aside, Validity is the one that you is a really big deal that you want to get correct. Is that programmer has annotated uh, correctly, then the program proof should go through is a is a big deal. Also, invalidity of formulas is you can check it in other ways, which are much easier. For example, if you have data structures, you could just check for bounded data structures, like five element lists. Is it valid, right? Um, and typically, you will find these errors. Or you could do bounded model checking, which by bounded model checking will explore only a finite subset of the a bounded subset of the heap anyway, um, and it'll already find that your your uh, uh, your logical formulas are, are, do not hold uh, your assertions do not hold. So there are much easier ways of handling invalidity, and so that's an orthogonal problem that we do not study in this tutorial. Um, but it is true that, you know, in practice, many of these tools do not support invalidity, right? Like Daphne and Liquid. They don't give you simple ways to do this. Leon does, but um, explicitly supports this, but many tools don't. So here's our invitation, right? Is our conjecture is that if you follow thrifty ISMT techniques that are FO complete, then that's a great engineering dis principle to build effective reasoning tools. There is some evidence of this conjecture, right? Mainly in verification of imperative and functional programs, where tools are based on this technique and they work really well, and they are FO complete. But of course, only time will tell whether the conjecture is actually true. 
So our invitation is for you to try this approach in various settings. So the workflow is simple. You identify problems in first order logic or with uh, background theories. Um, this can be hard. Sometimes you need first order logic with re recursive definitions or least fixed points or whatever, and you'll have to abstract them into first order logic definitions. Uh, Aditya will go into how to do that. Then you identify thrifty instantiation strategies for rich fragments that still give you FO completeness. Or you, you can use one of the fragments we have provided, the two fragments that we have, and then you can implement and evaluate. And there's a lot of engineering to make sure that you're doing instantiations slowly and um, uh, reasonably according to the domain, right? Um, uh, and, and only then will it scale, right? But this is a reasonable strategy to follow to get first order reasoning for program verification. There are a couple of caveats. First order completeness does not mean effectiveness in practice, but it's a, it's a theoretical result. Instantiations can quickly get large. You need to engineer slow and um, relevant growth according to your domain to tame the complexity of the blow up. And so this thrifty part is very important. Um, the second one is first order reasoning may not be precisely what you want. Um, in fact, in both these applications, first order reasoning is not the actual problem, but there's an abstraction of the problem that the tools actually solve. Uh, and the abstraction is FO reasoning. Um, but you need to bridge this gap between the actual problem that you have and this FO um, formulation that you need to solve. And Aditya is going to go into that in more detail. So I'm going to stop here. I think um, we, uh, we are at the time of the break. So let's take some questions. Are there any questions? Can you hear me, Aditya? Yeah, I can hear you. I think they had a problem. Yeah.
can you hear us? So yeah, select the built-in. So uh, can you hear us? Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, okay. 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 Great. Uh, sorry, can uh, you hear me? Sorry, but we do have a question. Yes. Uh, hello, oh. sir. Okay. It's, uh, the the microphones were disconnected for a while. We had a technical issue in here, but we heard your talk. <laughs> The 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 question is sort of you had some you talked about sort of the limitations of combining theories with quantifiers, right? What are the what are the computational limitations of that? That you say suppose that uh, I have a theory that quantifies over all well type programs, and then I have a theory that quantifies over the ones that terminate, and I want to combine my theories. Or well, can you say something about that? Is the question clear? Do you want decidability or? Uh, 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 or sort of completeness, let's say I have, yeah. two, I have two complete theories. So it's sort of, uh, well, uh, if it's in my theory, it'll stop and say yes. And uh, if it's not, then I don't know what happens. Yeah. Uh, but then I just want to combine two theories, let's say one that uh, uh, I just want to sort of what are the what are the limitations of combining two complete theories that are uh, not closed or right. that are quantified? Yeah, I think so. In general, I think if you combine quantified theories, um, you don't get completeness, um, and um, we don't know of uh, you know there are some. So we are talking about combinations where. You have different signatures and they only share equality like Nelson Open. That kind of combination, you know, it's extremely hard to get completeness. Uh, there are other forms, like if you take the product of two theories, right? Um, then there are theorems that actually show that you can retain completeness. So this is the Pfefferman Ford theorem and other things. But um, when you have this, yeah, sorry. No, yeah, so we'll come up here so, to speak what, the, what precisely does it mean to take the product of two theories? So you you have the product of the models involved in the two theories. So you it has one component. So everything has two components and one uh, one okay, theory yes. is talking about one and the other. So you have a equ equational substitution logic or something like that as the initial algebra. Yeah. Uh, or uh, or just product. I mean, it's just normal product of uh, the models. Um, so, um, as a model theory, if you just take the product, yes. right, and then you can you can uh, you you do have some theorems for combinations. But in the Nelson Open style, where you have, I talk about you know uh, certain functions and relations, and you talk about certain functions and relations, and we combine our theories. It's you know, it quickly breaks down, um, and you won't get completeness. Okay, but then uh, so can you can you give an example of why it breaks down? So, so you so you, so first of all, this this example is a Pressburg arithmetic and unintegrated functions. Both of them, you know, are complete, right? So you have um, uh, the the fragments are. Um, Pressburg arithmetic quantified is decidable even, right? And uninterpreted functions, it is complete, right? When you when you combine them, you get an incomplete theory, right? Um, so this is well studied in logic, right? Um, but um, 
the number of positive results of combination combining them are very few. I, I know of hardly anything except the FFM and Ford theorem. There are very way, few ways of actually combining these theories to preserve completeness. Okay. One way to describe why that happens is these non-standard models in each one can can combine in ways which uh, have a different set of theorems to be true. So when you have Pressburg arithmetic, the non-standard model of Pressburg arithmetic combined with functions gives you a different theorem, like I said, which um, which you cannot get using. The, so so what it really means is that in the combined theory, you may not be able to prove things just using your axioms of the individual theories. Um, uh, so uh, is there in, is there any work on sort of a sort of sort of, uh, sort of what is the the smallest sort of theory that is combinable? No, uh, we're just discovering. Say, oh, I, uh, we we have just discovered these two uh, ones, um, but uh, I don't know of any. So they they could be. I mean, we're not experts in uh, this logic thing here. So. Uh, there might be some weird logics that are combinable, but uh, I do not know of any such result. Okay. Well, These two examples are the only ones I know. <laughs> well, thank you for your talk. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if there are any other questions. There are several people left because of the technicalities that. Uh, Oh, okay. All right. This sort of, the, what I was thought was sort of like something that was uh, closed under combination, like clo clo closed for completeness under combination by construction rather than sort of uh, 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 by analysis. That, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, the combination we're talking here about is just axiomatic combination. So you take the axioms and you just take the union of them. That combination is very hard to preserve completeness. Your conjecture, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, so, uh, what does a certificate look like? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'll go frozen. So your, I can hear you very well. But. Ah, okay. Yeah. So your conjecture. Uh, what does a what does a certificate looks like? That uh, like suppose that I disprove your conjecture. What uh, what does my certificate look like? Um. So I think. Um, so the conjecture you know, in some sense is um, a kind of empirical, right? So it's, uh, you know, you just have to say it doesn't work in the setting, right? But um, so the conjecture is that thrifty ISMT techniques that are FO complete are going to work well in, in, in practice. Um, I think there are simple ways to refute the conjecture by get, taking things which are incredibly complex, right? So, um, but I think some reasonable thing where it is FO complete, but and they are, are fairly simple, right? Uh, problems, um, let's say, for other kinds of techniques like proof theory based techniques, but this does not work, even though it's FO complete, would be uh, a way to refute it. Okay. Yeah, because I was sort of thinking, okay, I'll build an ineffective reasoning tool. <laughs> it's more like a engineering principle, right? So um, uh, that's the idea, is that it's an engineering principle for building effective tools, right? So if you just build, you know, just quantify instantiation, it's, it's not going to work. Um, that's been the anecdotal evidence. And here's a recipe where it seems to work. Right, if you if you have a full completeness, um, so yeah, the question is, it's like you know, um, polynomial time algorithms work well in practice, right? 
Yeah. Of course, they don't work well in practice if your constants are super high. But that doesn't mean that, uh, I mean, it is true that most polynomial time algorithms work well in practice. But of course, there are cubic algorithms that fail miserably, right? So, um, but, uh, and exponential algorithms can beat polynomial time algorithms in practice too, right? So, but po is polynomial time algorithms a good um, way to design something so that it works in practice? I think it is. Uh, so it's in that sense that this, is a conje this conjecture is. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I think we have a break for the next 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, we might need to do some rejoin during a few setup that we have in here. Uh, so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's coffee on the second floor, uh, on Maxwell, where the registration desk works. Thank you for dealing with this very first yeah. setup. Yeah. And uh, thank you on Zoom uh, for Thanks dealing with it also. Uh, we're going to try to fix it in the next 15 minutes. Um, so maybe just rejoin and uh, we'll just rejoin. We can just hang out here. That's also fine. Uh, yeah, whatever you want. Um, yeah. Is it yeah. important that we rejoin for the audio issues to work? No, no, no. I, I mean, rejoin for the second session. Oh, they are not the second session. Are, do you guys, are you guys doing this again? Yes, we're doing okay. the 11 to yeah, 12 so you, 30 session. You guys can just hang out in the room. We'll, we'll need to do some stuff with this. Yeah. But is, you guys can just stick around the Zoom room if you like. Yeah. Thank well, you. Is this the other tutorial? This is the other this tutorial. This is the other tutorial. Yeah, because the other tutorial just entered our Zoom room. So I wanted to notify them that probably something went wrong because that's our Zoom room. They entered like your they Zoom room. They are in your Zoom room? Wait. Yep. So, so a user called String Solving Tutorial just entered the MetaCorp. Zoom room. Shrinks. What? <laughs> Shrink solving tutorial isn't today. It's not today. I don't think so. All right, then probably they just want to test things and we're not letting them into another. Okay. 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 Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> wait, shrink solving is today. I believe it's later. Uh, maybe it's afternoon. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's not I think they want to try something. Uh, yeah. I think they've been because we don't want them to try it. Maybe. Uh, we all, we all oh. check now. <laughs> Thank you. Are you? Uh, okay. Are we switching to the back or are we roads? I don't know. I assumed you, you said that you wanted to rejigger this room. And so I, I did. Um, okay, hold on. I'm going to, here's what I'm going to, that's not the right button. Is it? Uh, Can you see Mike? The road? Uh, I see webcam. I see wireless go to RX. Yeah. Is it this one? Yeah, I assume so. Okay, for now this works. Um,
Yeah, yeah, I can make it bigger. I think it's just small because they're. Yes, I, I can make it bigger. Uh, I'm. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything else is barely working, okay. but I, I, I will do that. Thank you so much. Yeah. You are auto change at the desk, not the decimator, the signal cleaner thingy in um, Mark. Okay, thank you. Ah, uh, yeah, Hello. Hello. <laughs>
Hey, if you move to this side of the room, they should be able to see you. Uh, but up to you. <laughs> um, I can move it. Do you know what time it was about to start? 11? Yep. Yeah. Okay.
Um, okay, this is good to go for okay. now. Okay. If this if this dies, uh, -huh. uh just this one. Um, I'm gonna let it charge for now. Okay. But if this dies, just, okay, uh, perfect. Uh, press this button and hold it okay. up here, and then one. Should also be okay. active on the screen. So this talk will be until um, uh, one or one thirty. Eleven to um, the morning was nine to ten thirty. Yeah. So it should this one should be twelve thirty. Until twelve thirty. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Are you here? Yeah. Okay. Are okay. good to go? Yeah, you're good to go. So uh, use this one and then okay. You perfect. Figure out how to turn this one on. Let me know. Okay. Uh, otherwise, I can always. But yeah, okay. yeah, you can. Right. Um, okay, thank you so much. You can take it away. All right. Okay, so welcome back for the second session. So we covered some foundations in the first part of the talk. We're now going to see some results on FO completeness uh, of the instantiation plus SMT solving technique in this part of the talk. Are you able to see the slide transition? Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, there's really two application domains that we're going to talk about uh, here. Um, they were introduced in the first session. I'm just going to recall them. The first one is verification of imperative programs. So let's look at this definition L seg over here, which is which defines a pointer based uh, list segment. It says x points to y, and if it's that happens if either x equals y or if um, x points to uh, if the next of x points to y um, in a, in a list segment. That definition over there is correct. So now you have a program uh, that has a precondition where x points to y, and in the body of the program you check whether y equals nil, and depending on whether it equals nil or not, you set another variable z to either y or the next of y. And uh, I've depicted this in the figure to the right, the blue arrow is you swinging a pointer from y to z. And then you have your post condition, you now have to show that x points to z. So this is a kind of toy uh, verification problem, but you typically do these kinds of things, right? You have 
pre and post conditions that are uh, quantify a free first order formulas they can use recursive definitions and they um and then you swing pointers in the uh, in the body of your in the body of your code this is just, this is a basic block that i've depicted here now the verification condition for this problem can be um can be written as this formula on the bottom of the slide so you have that if else x y holds and if the program executes then else x z holds note that this is a formula in first order logic with recursively that that mentions or uses recursively defined functions and relations and here x y and z are elements of an abstract sort of uh, heap location so this is a, a generic sort this this is a sort of objects uh, you can think of it that way and they have each object has like a pointer like next the second domain we'll even look at is functional program verification so here you will notice that it's kind of similar we have a set of definitions that are recursively defined here you have um this algebraic data type of list over integers there's a function insert back that inserts a number at the back of a given list so it climbs all the way until the end and uh, puts the number to be inserted over there and then there's a uh, recursively defined function find that goes through each element and uh, checks if you found the uh, element to be found uh, anywhere uh, through the list and the property you want to check is that if you just inserted a, an element k into a list x then if you check whether k can in fact be found in that list you'll you'll get the it, it in fact can be found and the answer is true so this property is also a formula in first order logic with recursively defined functions this is a different domain though uh, here variables can range over a sort of algebraic data types in addition to other sorts like integers or sets and these other types that you use like reals or what not and um there's a subtlety here in that definitions technically do not need to um be interpreted in the in least fixed point semantics which was true in the imperative uh, program verification world that we saw uh, but we're going to highlight this difference for now and we'll come back to this later um, if you have any questions so um over these two application domains there's a common pattern that's emerging which is that verification is verification problems can be understood as the validity of a quantifier free first order formula with recursive definitions so that mentions recursive definitions there are a couple of assumptions that i'm making here uh, i'm assuming that pre and post conditions are quantifier free but they can in fact use recursively defined relations and functions uh, this is typical i'm also assuming that the basic block transformation can be written without any quantification now uh, this is technically speaking not true for uh let's say heap manipulating programs where if you have a function call the way you'd encode the transformation of uh, of that basic block into a formula would involve quantification where you'd uh, say things like a frame rule right so um you'd say that for objects that are not in the uh, footprint of the called function those objects properties remain the same right because otherwise the your, your function call could have havoked it so um but but for that right both of these application domains have this form of a quantifier free formula that whose validity must be checked under certain given definitions and verification tools both for imperative and functional programs generate vcs of this kind right so you can think of um the natural proofs or um which is which is so first order logic or separation logic based verified verifies like dryad or even functional program verifiers like liquid haskell and leon they all generate vcs that are of the form under definitions prove some quantifier free formula that can mention those defined function symbols okay so that's these are the problems that we're going to look at and we're talk going to talk about how we solve these problems what uh, is the automation technique and uh, what properties we this the fo completeness that uh, uh, that these procedures have so first let's look at imperative program verification uh, the logical setup here the the abstraction is one of a multi sorted first order logic we already saw this in the first half of the talk there's a predominant foreground sort uh, which is uh, what uh, which are supposed to model the primary objects that you're talking about so in this case these are locations that foreground sort is supposed to be uninterpreted so the theory is empty it's just to model locations now the functions that are between various sorts are also uninterpreted 
Um, the theories over the background sorts can be anything. So you can have a theory of integers, a theory of sets, theory of reals, whatnot. But, uh, and then you, you have this abstract uninterpreted sort of objects and you state formulas over this, um, over this logic. Now the main restriction is that the quantify a free fragment of the combined theories for the background sorts might actually, must actually be decidable. This is very true in practice because we are going to use an SMT solver to uh, solve the quantify free formulas that are generated by the instantiation procedure. And SMT solvers do implement decision procedures over combined uh, integer set, real, et cetera, theories. Uh, and of course, uninterpreted functions. So uh, to give you a concrete example, uh, the foreground sort S0 would model heap locations. The background sorts would be integers, int, and set of S0, which would model heaplets, their sets of locations. You will have uninterpreted functions next and key, which would uh, you would use to define a linked list. And the way you do that is you'd have an uh, uninterpreted relation LSEG denoting a list segment and a function LSLEN denoting the length of that list segment. And then you give... Um, first order definitions for them. And we'll see what these first order definitions are. So the main thing to note here is that the general logic that I've introduced in the previous slide is not one for which the instantiation is complete. So there's a specific fragment. Uh, and we'll talk about what this fragment is and how expressive it is um, in, the, in the coming slides. So let's look at what this fragment is first. The first restriction is that quantification is only allowed over the foreground sorts. So you're allowed to say for all objects X, something holds. Uh, you, so when you define a list segment, you'll say uh, for all objects X and objects Y, LSEG XY holds if and only if some definition, right? Uh, but you're not allowed to say for all integers, something happens. The second restriction is that uninterpreted functions uh, in the theory that contains symbols between various sorts are one way in the sense that they can map the foreground sort to the background sorts, but not the other way. So I depicted this using the green arrows that you can see in the figure. These arrows are not uh, back and forth. They're just one way. Let me give you an example. Uh, here's a verification condition for an iterative list append. This is the, this is the VC corresponding to the loop invariant. So here you have uh, two parts. You have the what I'm calling definitions of LSEG and LSLEN, list segment and the length of the list segment. Uh, these are not definitions in the least fixed point sense. These are fixed point definitions because now you're saying for all X and Y, LSEG XY holds if and only if something else, if, if and only if the body holds. Um, a least fixed point definition would say that LSEG would in fact have to be the least such solution to this if and only if equation. We're not saying that. Uh, this is a first order uh, abstraction of the original least fixed point definition. And similarly, we do the same for LSLEN. We say for all XY, LSLEN XY equals the body of the definition. And then there is the property to check, uh, which roughly speaking says, um, if S points to T, if uh, S goes to T in a segment, and uh, S, the next of S is S prime, then S prime also goes to T. And moreover, the length of S prime is one less than the length of S. So it's just the element next to S. Uh, it's still connected to, eventually connected to T, and its length to T, its distance to T is one less. The key point here is that to model problems in this fragment, we abstract the least fixed point definitions into fixed points using um, universal quantification for the, for the formal parameters for the variables, and uh, if and only if to um, relate the symbol to its body, uh, but it's otherwise treated as uninterpreted. So this, in fact, falls into the fragment. You can see that there's, there are only one-way functions. LSEG relates um, two foreground elements to Booleans. LSLEN relates two foreground elements to an integer, uh, maps two foreground elements to an integer. And the functions used are just next, which uh, again goes from the foreground sort to the foreground sort, goes from an object to an object. So it does satisfy this fragment. And actually, several things do satisfy the fragment, but we have to check this carefully. Many, many recursively defined functions fall into the safe fragment. So you can have functions like length or height or the maximum element in tree. Those map uh, objects to integers or locations to integers. Then you have predicates like list tree, binary search tree, AVL tree. You can define them recursively. And those also map 
uh, locations to booleans, which is again one way. And then you can have functions that compute the heaplet of a list or the heaplet of a tree, and those map uh, locations to sets of locations, which is also one way. But um, importantly, not all commonly used defined functions fall into the safe fragment. So it's very expressive, but one has to be careful about modeling uh, VCs in this fragment because we want to take advantage of the completeness theorem. So for example, uh, in many uh, works, uh, for example, in separation logic, uh, one defines a predicate that, ha that um, takes a list and uh, an, a number and says that it's true when that list has that length. So uh, here the range needs to be bool. It's, uh, it's not right. So um, this is not a one-way function because it combines a foreground and a background element. It combines a location and an integer and maps it to a background, which is a Boolean. So this is not in the safe fragment and we cannot handle uh, the completeness theorem does not apply to uh, VCs that use such definitions. Uh, are there any questions at this point? Okay. So now that you have this logic of uninterpreted foreground and background and one-way functions, the instantiation procedure is actually very simple. You have a set of universally quantified formulas. Remember the quantifications only over the foreground sort, that's phi. And then you have a quantifier free formula, which is the property that you want to check, which is psi, right? Typically phi is a set of definitions and you want to check the validity of psi under the definitions phi. So this, Procedure uh, is a RE procedure, so it'll either terminate and say that the theorem is valid, that psi is in fact valid under phi, or it'll go on forever. And the way it does this is that it starts out by negating the goal, so we're going to check uh, satisfiability of the negation of the uh, formula. We want to check whether phi implies psi, we're going to check whether assuming phi not psi is provable, right? So, and if it's not, you'll get, uh, it's satisfiable. So if it's not, you will get unsat, which is what we want. So uh, this loop goes on forever until you reach unsat. And the way it does, the, and what it does until then is that it looks at the ground terms occurring in the goal at any point. So uh, initially you just have the negation of your property and you will keep adding more and more instantiated formulas to it. It'll collect the ground terms occurring in, in those in those quantifier free formulas and instantiate the quantified formulas with those terms. So that's the second line that you see as it instantiates every quantified formula with the collected terms. And then once you obtain these instantiations, the addition, uh, you will add them to the current set of formulas that you have and check whether now you can prove your goal again, right? And if you can't, then you'll collect more terms and so on. Now to see how this works in practice and why there are these repeated instantiations, um, let's look at an example. So this is an FO abstracted verification problem uh, that we saw a couple of slides ago. So you have definitions for LSEG and LS length, and you want to check whether uh, when LSEG S to T holds and S prime is the next element to S, whether S prime uh, also is a list segment until t and its length is less than uh, s to t by one, right? Th we know that this is true, but we want to prove this using this instantiation procedure. So what does the instantiation procedure do? It collects the terms that occur in the quantifier free portion, which is uh, the two conjuncts at uh, the, the latter two conjuncts. And the first round of instantiation will essentially take those terms and instantiate the two former conjuncts, the L second and L second definition, with all possible combinations of those terms. So this would be X and Y ranging over S, S prime T, nil and next of X, which are the ground terms occurring in your property. And it will then send this formula with uh, quite a few conjuncts to, the S to an SMT solver and ask whether this is unsatisfiable. And in this case, the SMT solver can in fact show that this formula is unsatisfiable. Uh, let's see why that is. So if you look at um, the definition of L seg S to T, it says if S equals T, which is not true in this case, because we have S not equal to T, uh, it's true, but otherwise L seg next of S to T must hold, right? And we know that S prime equals next of X. So you do obtain that L seg S prime to T holds. Similarly, if you look at L S len of S to T, you will check whether S equals T, that's not the case, but then 
the, the instantiator formula will tell you that it's one plus the length of uh, S prime to T. And so an SMT solver will e easily be able to crunch this down and show that this instantiation is in fact um, unsatisfiable. Now, if this were not unsatisfiable, you try one more round and you'd collect all the terms occurring in this formula, which is now, which now includes next of S and you, uh, this is not a term that we instantiated before. Um, sorry, next of T, right? This is not a term that we instantiated before. And now you'd also instantiate the next of T, next of next of X, S and so on. The, the this turns out to be not just a heuristic, the, the cool and surprising part is that this is actually FO complete. Uh, the formal statement is as follows. If you have uh, phi, which are these quantifier, quantified formulas and psi being a quantified free formula, you're checking whether um, the quantified formulas imply the quantifier free formula. And this ISMT procedure terminates and returns valid if and only if this theorem that you want to check is FO valid. So in, you are taking a real verification problem that has least fixed point definitions and you're abstracting them into fixed point definitions. But once you do that, the instantiation procedure is actually complete for the first order validity of the abstracted problem. Now, um, Note that the instantiation procedure is actually very thrifty, right? So um, if you th think about instantiation and completeness, Gilmore back in 1960 used exhaustive term instantiation, uh, and we spoke about this at the, in the first half of the talk, to actually um, produce a, a first order theorem prover, right? And this is of course FO complete because of Herbrand theorem. If you instantiate all possible terms, then you can in fact get completeness, but this is very, very, very expensive. In contrast, ISMT is a very thrifty instantiation procedure that also happens to be FO complete. To kind of illustrate this thriftiness, let's look at an example. So consider the, uh, this is a very simple toy validity problem. You have, an, you have a quantified formula that says F and uh, G, are, uh, G is a right inverse of F. So you have F of G of X equals X. And then uh, you have uh, that Y equals G of Z and F of Y you want uh, to show that it's equal to Z, right? So you've just uh, introduced an intermediate variable Y uh, corresponding to G of Z and you're applying F again. And because we know F of G of anything equals itself, this should, um, you should be able to prove this valid. Now ISMT would say instantiate the quantifier with just the ground terms occurring on the right-hand side. So that would just be Y, Z, F of Y and G of Z, right? At least in the first round. Whereas exhaustive instantiation, you know, according to the uh, Gilmore work, would instantiate many, many more terms compared to ISMT, right? It would inst instantiate terms like G of Z, uh, G of Y, F of Z, G of F of Y, F of F of Z, all of these combina various combinations of uh, these function symbols applied to the ground terms that do not even occur in the formula, right? And adding all these instantiations can blow up very quickly. This is just terms of height two, and I'm already writing dot, 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 right? So, um, and imagine if the quantified if the quantified portion on the, in the antecedent were even larger, this would make the resulting SMT query very large and it's absolutely not practical. In fact, ISMT is not just thrifty, but anecdotally, we know that even one or two rounds of instantiation suffice, right? So theoretically, you can say that ISMT can run forever. It can instantiate larger and larger height terms and actually make the SMT query quite large. But we know that anecdotally from you know, work on imperative program verification and functional program verification that just one or two rounds of instantiations actually suffice. So uh, that's what makes this really interesting. It's, it's effective in practice, and it also has this nice theoretical property of being FO complete. So um, when I say it's actually effective in practice, uh, I really do mean this. Uh, there's work that uh, was published um, in uh, 2014, where this work VC Dryad implemented uh, the ISMT procedure for Dryad, which is a variant of separation logic. It converts it to first order logic and uses ISMT to solve the resulting problems. Um, the tool was evaluated over about 150 imperative programs manipulating various kinds of um, pointer-based data structures like linked lists, circular lists, queues in OpenBSD, all kinds of things. And it turns out to be very efficient. You can actually see from the table, I don't know if uh, participants are able to see this. Um, many of them verify in under five seconds. So it's actually very, very, very effective. 
Okay, uh, do we have any questions at this point? Uh, do we have questions? No. Okay. Okay. Right. So um, we just covered the application domain of imperative data structures, imperative program verification. Now, there's another application domain of functional program verification where the same story plays out. So this is, in fact, the kind of surprising thing that uh, we have discovered in the many years that we've been looking at this, is that this ISMT and, and, and thrifty instantiation seems to be complete and actually leads to practically effective tools in various domains, right? So now let's look at a second domain, namely functional program verification, and I'll um, go through the same things that we did in the imperative world and actually show that it's thrifty and that it works. So uh, here the logic is a little different. Uh, we had in the imperative world, an uninterpreted foreground sort. Uh, that's not true here. The foreground sort is typically constrained by a theory of algebraic data types. Like I said, the foreground sort is the, is the primary objects about which you're uh, stating your verification problems or your theorems. In functional programs, those are algebraic data types. And the, the theory of algebraic data, it's constrained by the theory of algebraic data types, uh, which includes um, the initial term algebra, but you know can include any model that satisfies that theory. There are various axiomatizations. We are going to be agnostic to the axiomatization in this talk. It actually doesn't matter. But you can pick your favorite axiomatization that says um, distinct elements must create uh, distinct elements. Um, unequal elements destructed will create unequal elements. No junk, um, any, uh, any set of axioms that you'd like. So, um, so that's the foreground sort, it's algebraic data types. The background theories can, in fact, be anything. But again, we want that the quantifier free fragment of the combined theories must be decidable. And again, this is true because we are going to reduce to SMT and the quantifier free fragments of the sorts typically used in verification, like integers, sets, reals, um, are in fact, and, and including algebraic data types and uninterpreted functions, are in fact decidable. Um, so here's an example. Uh, let's say that. The foreground sort is constrained by an ADT theory of lists over integers. That's a very specific ADT. Uh, you have a background sort of integers. And so the symbols nil, cons, head, tail, etc., would be constrained by the ADT theory. And then you'd have symbols like plus, minus, um, less than, which would be constrained by the integer theory. You can also have uninterpreted functions, uh, namely a length function that can go from the list sort to the integer sort. And we can, as before, define len using a quantified formula, right? You can say for all x, len x is, you know, zero if x is nil, but otherwise it's one plus the length of the tail. And this is the typical definition of length that you would see in, in functional program, when you write a functional program. So here uh, we again have a very particular fragment for which ISMT is complete. So the general logic is not complete um, with respect to the thrifty instantiation scheme. Uh, we want, as before, formulas of the form definitions imply some prop quantifier free property psi. So this, you want to check whether psi is valid under the given definitions. But the definition, we also have some very specific properties. So when definitions, think of them as having the form for all x, f of x equals some rho of x, where f is the function you're defining, and rho is the body of that definition. x uh, can range over any, um, any set of sorts. Um, the key thing that we require in this fragment is that the definitions need to have termination proofs. And uh, let me say what I mean by this. You, so you can, so you, you all right. <laughs> one typically uses ranking functions to prove termination, right? The way one does this is that you assign a rank to every element, and then you show that recursive calls decrease in rank, right? So formally, if you have a function f whose body recursively calls g, then you want to show that the rank of f is in fact greater than the recursive call the rank of g. And this inequality must be provable in first order logic. Uh, for example, length is probably terminating because um, if you look at the definition on the previous slide, we have the recursive call length that happens on tail of x. And we just have to show that the rank of x is greater than the rank of tail of x. And this is in fact true because if you think of rank as basically the subterm order in the uh, in an algebraic data type, you do have that um, the tail of a list is smaller than the list and, and you can take the tail of that and keep going down. So if you have such terminating definitions, then the ISMT procedure um, takes 
these um, such formulas and tries to prove the theorem. It's slightly different from the ISMT procedure we saw in the uh, in the imperative world. Uh, so, let's, so let's see what that is. So as before, you are, we are, we're converting this to the satisfiability problem, and we want to show that the negation of the property psi that we want to show is actually unsat. But here, the terms that you collect are not arbitrary ground terms that occur in the goal. You look at terms that occur under specific applications. So if you have a defined function f, you only look for terms of the form f of t bar, and you collect those in pairs. And then you expand or you instantiate the definitions on only those terms. So if you had uh, f of t bar and a g of r bar, you would only expand the definition of f on t bar and you would only expand the definition of g on r bar. And then again, you add these instantiations to your set of quantifier free formulas and you keep continuing until an SMT solver can show that it is unsatisfiable. Now, note that this is even more thrifty than the procedure that we saw in the imperative world, right? So this is a very specific form. Instead of arbitrary universally quantified formulas, we in fact have definitions. And so um, instead of collecting all terms, we are in fact collecting only application-specific terms and expanding the definitions on them. And this is in fact a procedure that's very similar to the ones used in practical verification tools like liquid Haskell for Haskell, Leon, or, or this uh, more modern version, stainless for Scala programs, uh, or even Daphne, or at least the functional subset of it, right? Uh, we really came across this procedure by looking at these practical tools and, and abstracting what they were doing. And uh, this covers quite a few functional program verification tools that are used in practice. I want to show you an example of what this actually looks like. So um, let's look at these, this problem. You have two definitions. You have sorted and you have insert. Um, the details of the definitions aren't very important. They're defined in the usual way. You uh, check whether a list of integers is sorted by going through the elements and checking whether each element is less than the next one. Insertion uh, inserts an element by, uh, again, comparing the element to be inserted on the list. Um, and inserting it right at the point um, uh, when um, it, it, it occurs in the sorting order of the list, right? And now you want to show that if you have, this is the property that you prove in a recursive call where is the similar to the loop invariant property that we saw. So if you had the fact that for a sorted list, if when you insert an element, you, you're supposed to obtain a sorted list. And the way you prove that by induction or the way you prove that in a recursive call is that you would assume this property for a smaller list, namely tail of x, and you try to show it for x. Right? So here you can apply the ISMT procedure that we saw in the previous slide. And you do this by instantiating the definitions on the specific application terms occurring in the property, which is the uh, consequent that you see at the bottom of these, um, of the, of these formulas. So you would only instantiate sorted on x, tail of x, insert k, uh, xk, and so on. And you'd only instantiate insert on xk and tail of xk, because those are the only two uh, lists that you're interested in reasoning about. And the, again, the SMT solver can in fact show that this, once you instantiate, the instantiation conjoined with the property is actually unsatisfiable. And you can basically follow the definitions and see that this is true. The, there's a very interesting intuition that comes about here because we are only expanding the definitions on, on the terms on which they applied in the formula. This amounts to a kind of symbolic computation of the definitions, right? So you have a term f of x bar that occurs in your formula. You'd expand the definition of f on x bar. That will result in some other g of y bar. And then you'd expand g on y bar and so on and so on, right? So you're essentially taking recursively defined function terms in your property and you're symbolically computing them according to the definition up to a certain depth and you're checking whether that is sufficient to show your property. Now, despite being such an intuitive and obvious and you know, uh, cheap heuristic, it turns out that this is also complete, right? Uh, that's, again, this um, occurrence of something where Simple, a simple quantified instantiation technique that works well in practice actually turns out to have this nice theoretical property of completeness, right? Uh, the completeness theorem, the formal statement is that if you have a set D of definitions and you have a quantifier free property psi that you want to prove, then 
the ISMT procedure that symbolically uh, expands the definitions on psi ad infinitum terminates and returns valid if and only if the psi is actually valid under the given definitions. And this is um, the notion of validity is over the combination of theories um, the, in the logic that I introduced. The, this is actually a very hard theorem uh, in the sense that the, the proof is actually quite complex. So I think it, it deserves to have the intuition spelt out, which is what I'm going to do now. So think about, uh, it's essentially a model construction argument, right? So what do you want to show? You want to show that if the instantiation fails, then the property is not FO valid, namely that the negation of the property has a model, right? The way you do that is by actually looking at the terms on which you'd expanded the recursively defined function. So if you had something like length, you would, if you had it on X, you'd expand it, you'd get length on tail of X, and then you will get it on tail of tail of X and so on. And you would add all these instantiations, and then you'd still not be able to prove the resulting property, right? So then I have to show that you get a model where length actually is defined for all elements, but the property is still not true, right? Because that's what um, you want to show. You want to show that the property is not true under the definitions. So you want to have a model where the definitions hold, where length actually has its intended uh, first order definition, but the property is not true. But here you've only expanded the definition of length for certain terms that occur in your formula, right? Uh, if, so you can think of this as a kind of uh, iceberg where you have a certain level below which you have computed the terms, but then there are terms occurring above it or you know, even independent of it where you've not expanded the definition. We call this set of um, terms where you've expanded the definitions downward as a computational closure, right? It's uh, the closure of all terms that occur in a symbolic computation of your definition on the terms. And the definitions are satisfied here once because you've done the instantiation and you've added them but you also have to show that the definitions can be extended beyond the computational closure. And that's essentially the gist of the proof. And we show that this can in fact be done and we construct a model this way. Uh, it's actually a very interesting proof and it's very general. So I uh, highly recommend uh, that you check out the paper. I have citations uh, at the end. Now, uh, I've spoken about um, ISMT and the completeness property in both the in the imperative program verification domain and the functional program verification domain. I but I've shown you examples where it succeeds. There are also examples where it fails, and this is because the ISMT procedure is only FO complete, and we really need the power of recursive definitions in order to prove all the properties that we'd like. Before we go there, uh, does anybody have any questions? Questions? Anyone? Uh, no, there's no questions. Thank you. Okay. All right. So there's a gap in the verification power that we need and the verification power that we actually have that are provided by these tools, which is basically ISMT, right? So in the imperative world, we can think of it as that ISMT fails when the least fixed point to fixed point abstraction creates a formula that is not FO valid. So your original formula that uses the actual least fixed point definitions is actually valid, is correct in the in first order logic with least fixed points. But once you abstract it to just first order logic, it's no longer FO valid, right? So let's look at an example of such a problem. Again, uh, we have this familiar definition of list segment. And you just want to show a transitive property about list segments, right? You just want to show that if A to B is a segment and B to C is a segment, then A to C is also a segment. And this is in fact true for, uh, for true list segments. But it turns out that ISMT will not work here. And uh, let's intuitively see why that is, right? So what will ISMT ask you to do? It will ask you to expand the definition of LSEG on the ground terms that occur in your formula. So you'd expand it on A comma B, B comma C, and so on. And then you'd ask whether there's a model of this formula. And you really want to get that it's unsat, right? That there's no model of the negation of the property. Unfortunately, there will be a model of this formula. And I've depicted the model here. So you have this spurious count example where B to C is in fact a list segment and um, it's the model evaluate, the model uh, gives a valuation to list segment as the accurate one. But then it also gives a spurious valuation for A and you know next of A and next of next of A 
where it says that it's a list segment to B, even though that's not the case, right? And the reason that this happens is, remember, when we do the first order abstraction, the LSEG is actually an uninterpreted function. It no longer has a definition. It's just constrained by this universally quantified formula, which, in fact, we have also thrown away and got into the abstraction where we only have certain quantified free formulas. So a model can give a valuation to list segment that need not reflect whether two elements are actually linked. Right? So this is such a model where uh, you can see that the model says A is linked to B and B is linked to C, but A is not linked to C. So it can give a valuation and it will in fact be consistent with the given definition because all the instantiated formula asks you to do is, is just check that LSEG A comma B has to hold if and only if either A equals B, which is not true in this case, or uh, next to A also is a list segment to B and the model will do that in a consistent manner. It will also mark the element next to A as though it's a list segment to B. Now you can say, okay, maybe this instantiation wasn't sufficient. Maybe more instantiations will help, but unfortunately more instantiations will also not help because you can come up with a slightly bigger model where this is true and your instantiations would have only forced you to relate A next of A and next of next of A, but really nothing beyond that. So you can once again give this spurious valuation where A is not really connected to B, but you can't tell and um, it'll uh, connect it to B, but say it's not connected to C. And once again, this transfer property will not hold. So it turns out that no matter how many times you instantiate, you cannot prove this pro property. What does that mean, right? If instantiation fails at all possible levels, then by the completeness theorem for ISMT, we actually know that the property is itself not valid in first order logic. Because the completeness theorem says that all valid properties, all FO valid properties are provable by this instantiation procedure. So the only conclusion is that because instantiation always fails, then this property is not FO valid. And what does it mean for a property to not be a theorem in first order logic? It means that there's a model, that there's a first order model that negates the property on which that property is false. We call such a model a rogue non-standard model. The reason we're calling it a rogue non-standard model is that it's kind of like non-standard models that are known in literature where they are kind of alternate models, unintended models of the theory that you've designed. But those models typically satisfy the same property as the standard intended model that you have in your mind. However, that's not the case here. This is a rogue model because it pretends to satisfy the definition, but actually falsifies your property, right? So when you say the theorem, is the property true under the definition? It'll say the definition holds, but the property does not hold. So let's see an example of what that uh, rogue non-standard model actually looks like, right? So uh, to recall, it should, this model should say that this property shown on the slide where the definition is true, but the property does not hold, right? So the transfer property is false, is actually satisfiable. This is that model, right? So you have this infinite uh, list that goes nowhere. So A does not terminate in a segment anywhere. And then B just goes to C and it's an isolated segment. Now, just like the... Um, like the model we saw in the earlier slide, this model will also evaluate the list segment from A to B and from next to A to B all as being true. It will say that A, next to A, and all these elements are actually actually eventually connected to B, whether where they're not, as you can see from the figure. And then it will also say that these elements are eventually not connected to C, right? So you will get that A is connected to B and B is connected to C, but A is not connected to C. But truly, A was never connected to B in the first place. You were just able to, but you could not tell because this is not a least fixed point definition, right? This is just a fixed point definition. All the, the quantified formula asks us to do is to say that LSEG XY holds if and only if either X equals Y or next of, y, or next of X also reaches Y. So I can just keep faking the fact that next of A reaches Y, next, next of A reaches B, next of next of A reaches B, and I can keep faking this and you know really never reach B. And the definition will in fact be satisfied, but the property will not be true. So this is a first order model where the definition does not reflect the intended meaning of the symbol. And, you've, and this has happened because you've gone from least fixed points to fixed points, which includes uh, more possibities, right? which includes more models. 
Now, how do you eliminate such spurious models? Because clearly, if you have these spurious models and you want to say whether the property is true, your property will not be true. So you want to kind of eliminate it from consideration and say, okay, I only want to check my property over legitimate models, right? And the way you do this is to actually ask whether the property is provable by induction, right? So instead of just asking whether um, when LSEG A, B, B, C holds, A, C holds, you ask whether if that transitive property is actually true for next to A, then can I show it for A, right? But that would certainly eliminate this model from consideration because the property is not true for next to A. You have a bunch of red arrows from next to A, but you have green arrows from A, right? So when you say I'm assuming it for next to A, here you the property for next to A is false, so it's vacuously true on this model, and you've kind of eliminated it from consideration, right? So that's how an induction proof helps eliminate this model and only consider uh, or, or consider a subset of more legitimate models, right? And more generally, you don't prove your property directly by induction. You figure out uh, an auxiliary lemma that you can prove by induction and then use the lemma to prove the property that you want. Um, these lemmas actually are varied and very common in practice. Um, in our experience, we uh, find that these lemmas relate to various kinds of properties, list segments, heaplets, uh, height, um, uh, you know, directed acyclic graphs, heaps, um, leftmost children, all kinds of things, right? And there are a huge number of lemmas that are actually required in practice uh, over, you know, many, many data structures. And typically these are given by users, right? So one has to give this in order for ISMT to even work on those problems. Otherwise, uh, you will have spurious models uh, these rogue non-standard models and your property will not be provable and, and tools, practical tools cannot prove them. So we saw this in the imperative world. This also happens in the functional world, right? It's the same story again. So here we, for example, have uh, definitions of insert back and find that we saw. Insert back inserts an element at the back and find just goes through the list and checks whether the element is there in the list. And you want to check whether after just inserting, if you uh, call find, whether it returns true, right? And again, ISMT does not work here. And to see why this is, think about a list that is about five elements long, right? And let's say you unfold three times, right? If you ask what the value of insert back of x comma zero is, because you've only unfolded three times, because you've only instantiated it on three of the smaller lists, you will know that zero has to be inserted past the one, past the two, two, past the three, but you don't know beyond that, right? And so because you don't know, when you call find, find will check saying, okay, I've checked the one, one is not equal to zero, two is not equal to zero, three is not equal to zero, and then it no longer has any information about the rest of the list. So it can in fact fake the value and say, you know what, it's not there, right? So your property can, can be falsified. And if you try more instantiations, I can give you an even longer list where this is true. And again, you will get a rogue non-standard model, um, just like we saw in the previous case, where you have an infinite list which is not really a list, but it just happens to satisfy the axioms of an algebraic data type of list, right? Um, and insert back just keeps shifting the zero to the back uh, one element after the next until it essentially loses the inserted key. So it, on any infinite list, it behaves like the identity. And then find goes through all the elements and then uh, just says, I, I couldn't find the key, right? So once again, you have to eliminate these spurious non-standard models because we don't really intend to check the property on any models where we have infinite lists, right? We are really thinking about a model of algebraic data types where we have finite lists. And once again, we have to eliminate such spurious models using lemmas, right? But here the gap in proving power is actually a little different between what we saw in the imperative world, right? So there the gap was between least fixed point and fixed point. But that's not quite the case here, right? Here, the gap is between your intended model of algebraic data types, integers, sets, whatnot, and the fact that you're doing a first order axiomatization of them. So when we looked at the logic, we said each sort is constrained by a theory, right? But a theory can admit more models than the intended model. And then what happens is that when you combine these theories, the combined set of models can in fact falsify the property, right? So you can have a 
and and ismt is only complete for the first order theory so it has to be true on every possible combination of the model of the theory right so uh, you can have a bunch of weird unintended models for each theory you can take the cross product for any of them and your property has to be true of on those as well and that's when ismt is complete and so even if there's one model where this is your property is not true ismt cannot prove it so the gap here is not really a gap between um least fixed points and fixed points but rather a gap between intended standard models and uh, models of the theory and again uh, you would bridge this gap and eliminate such spurious models by writing an inductive lemma or, or proving by induction where um, that property is not true on the rogue non standard model and therefore you by by assuming that lemma you've eliminated it from consideration and if you s eliminate sufficiently many rogue non standard models you'll only have well behaved models left where the property is true so um we looked at the fact that ismt by virtue of the fact that it's complete actually has a, a, a gap in expressive power that manifests in practice um between the intended problem and what we are able to prove using a practical te uh, technique and the question is whether we can bridge this gap right um Sorry, one one small comment before you go on another thing yeah so this is uh, in in practical tools like leon and um, liquid haskell these lemmas actually given by the user so the user gives these lemmas and um uh, they are required right so uh, this gap is the same gap in the practical tools as well and the user again give bridges this gap similar to the other imperative world yeah you can continue yeah so yeah that's that's right yeah this in fact reflects uh, that the theoretical framework presented here actually reflects uh, accurately the verification experience the user faces they they um, write a property that they strew in their mind they use these tools and the tool says they're not they they no, they don't hold and it's because there's an unintended model um on which that property is not true and then they some of give a lemma and it's crazy that users are actually able to do this uh, without knowing what the non standard models are they don't visualize them in their mind they kind of figure out uh, you know from a from a proof theoretic perspective what terms are not related and then they try and phrase a lemma that way right now so the the question is whether you know uh, this kind of massive user burden you, we saw these large tables of lemmas whether you can actually automate this uh, we can we can bridge the gap automatically and uh, it we can in fact do this automatically i'm going to um, not talk about this in as much detail as i would have liked uh, in the interest of time i think uh, we'd like to uh, sort of wrap up so we actually think of the problem as the following right so given a potential theorem that's not true in first order logic but is actually true in first order logic with recursive definitions you want to use ismt to prove it right so how are you going to do this you want to find a sequence of lemmas um l1 l2 through lk such that first of all each lemma is provable from you know given the previous ones by induction right and then the lemmas together prove your intended property right so i have written the induction proof as a uh, pfp over here pfp is basically a shorthand for prefix point formula and it's the formula that says what the induction template is so if you think of what an induction proof is it's usually a recipe right you 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 just said uh, check it on the base case and check it on the in, uh, do it on the inductive case assuming it for a smaller structure right so for imperative programs this would be tail uh, this would be next of x for algebraic data types this would be like tail or left of or right of x things like that right but this is a fixed recipe right so once you've given this recipe it's once again a first order proof you're just checking whether a certain formula is true right so we can think of this as the lemma synthesis problem statement you want to find a conjecture a set of interesting lemmas or properties such that they happen to be they are provable by induction and then uh, they they're valid uh, conjectures and then given these conjectures you can have a first order proof of your property and we're actually able to mechanize this um 
problems, a solution for this problem statement using a, a form of count example guided synthesis. Uh, we call this framework uh, FOSSIL, which is a first order solver with synthesis of inductive lemmas. Um, it has you know, a few different moving pieces. Um, the main thing is that if you see, there's an ISMT based FO prover, it checks whether uh, the lemmas are in fact proved by induction, which again, you know, is a first order proof. So you can use ISMT and it checks whether given the lemmas, the theorem is provable. If that's true, you, you're good. If that's not true, it asks a count example generated to generate a count example model, which then a lemma synthesis engine uses to propose further and further candidates um, that will keep eliminating these spurious models and uh, help you prove your property. Um, the count examples are actually obtained by virtue of the fact that um, you have ISMT actually generates a quantifier free formula. So you can give a quantifier free formula to an SMT solver and an SMT solver will be able to generate a counter model for it. Uh, note that this is not a model of the original formula that you had in mind because the original formula is a quantified formula. Uh, it will be a counter example only to the instantiated version. So it's more like a counter example to provability, right? The fact that you're not able to prove it using instantiation. But it turns out that these counter examples to provability, which are not legitimate counter examples, are in fact sufficient to automate lemma synthesis. And we in fact do this, right? Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just going to skip all this uh, in the interest, interest of time. We have th three kinds of counter examples uh, in this framework, right? Um, there you have counter examples to whether the theorem itself is provable from the lemmas, uh, that's type one. You have counter examples to whether the lemmas are themselves valid conjectures, uh, whether they're provable by induction, uh, that'd be type three. And then um, to induce some sense of um, ground truth into the whole thing, we also have another set of models, type two, where these are actually true models of first order logic with recursive definitions. And we compute these uh, small bounded models uh, that helps rule out um, just random spurious conjectures uh, that are not useful lemmas at all. And you know, uh, the lemma synthesis engine is able to use these three kinds of models to actually synthesize a lemma. Um, I think we are out of time. Um, you know, it, it, we operate this, we, we deploy this uh, tool, uh, this is the implementation using these count examples on the verification problems that you saw in the earlier slide on these 150 programs. And it, it's able to in fact synthesize lemmas that would have, the, the huge wall of lemmas that you saw that would have required a, a user to specify in a matter of seconds actually, which is very, very, very interesting. And it's a learner that um, conjectures interesting properties without understanding any anything about first order logic with least fixed point. It's just a first order learner that uses uh, certain kinds of count examples to conjecture interesting properties. So yeah, we're able to uh, do that. Um, I think, again, I'm going to um, uh, skip these in the interest of time. Uh, the one thing I want to mention is that um, the usage of count examples actually turns out to be a, a, a very useful signal in this case. It's a very semantic approach where uh, you might think just kind of enumerating possible conjectures might help. Enumeration actually does not work. And uh, we think that there's more to be done here using you know, uh, machine learning techniques, symbolic, neural, what have you, uh, to actually solve this challenge problem of automating verification, including synthesizing lemmas. Um, yeah, uh, with that, I actually do have a demo uh, planned. It's a very quick one. I wanted to show the fact that we have a tool and uh, that it actually works. And you know, we, I want to welcome you all to use it. Uh, but I will take questions uh, while I'm setting up the demo. Thank you so much. Are there any questions in the room? This is the microphone. Yeah, um, hello, yeah. Uh, thanks for the very nice talk to both you and Professor Madhusudan. Uh, I wanted to ask, how do you check when you have a rogue stand, a non-standard model in the first place? Uh, like, because if it's a first order no property, sure, the non-standard model might be undesirable, but it's still perfectly fine logically. So uh, how do you actually identify them? How do you specify the fact that it's non-intended? Um. Sorry, let me, I'm just trying to understand your question a little better. Um, so you're asking, how can you tell that there is a rogue non-standard model in the first place, right? Yeah. 
So when you have your original problem stated with recursive definitions, there are no unintended models, right? You've stated the problem in the logic that you actually want to state it in, and then you're good. Yeah. The moment you shift to the first order abstraction, you get all these new kinds of models that are coming up because you've moved to a weaker abstraction, right? Instead of having recursive definitions, you only have fixed points. Instead right. of having the intended model, you have a litany of models, right? Now, they're always going to be non-standard models, right? The qualification of when it is rogue is precisely when it does not satisfy the property. Uh, and we know that it does not satisfy the property when instantiation fails. So, uh, uh, should I maybe understand your question is asking, how can you tell when instantiation is going to fail? Uh, In no, practice, we know uh, if, it, if it fails within two rounds of instantiations, it usually just fails, right? Um, there could be various reasons for this. I can venture guesses, right? Uh, the fact that, you know, humans maybe cognitively don't think uh, about yep. uh, properties that require instantiations that are that deep. But essentially, in practice, we find that if it doesn't happen within two rounds of instantiation, it's it's not, in fact, FO valid then. And there is, in fact, a, 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 a spurious counter, a, a rogue non-standard model. We, in fact, went through a whole bunch of examples for liquid Haskell that are there in their standard repository. And we were able to come up with rogue non-standard models every time when liquid Haskell failed. It was kind right. of a pickle. OK, that makes sense. And uh, when you do the lemma conjecturing, does that happen? on the weaker fixed point version or the original recurs with the recursive definitions? Because that right. would affect the kind of lemmas that you're generating. Uh, yeah, so uh, the lemma conjecturing happens on both kinds of models. Um, it happens on, OK, so first of all, we don't really generate in the lemma conjecturing any rogue non-standard models. They're not really the rogue non-standard models that you see, because those would be count examples to instantiation ad infinitum, right? The, the, the rogue national models show that instantiation, no matter how many levels, is going to fail. Um, the models that we use are just uh, count examples to instantiation for like two levels or three levels. That's all, right? Because again, from empirical evidence, we know that if it fails in two, it's just going to fail, right? So we may not, the solver may not return a real rogue non-standard model, but it'll return a close enough approximation that has the rogueness, right? So that's the idea. But apart from that, but if we do that, we actually observed that we get a lot of unhelpful conjectures that are not even tied to reality in any sense of the word, right? So um, yeah. ro because rogue non-standard models are only wacky models. So we actually do enumerate uh, a set of small bounded models that are models of the least fixed point definitions. And those tend to ground the conjectures in something reasonable, right? So you want to, uh, and these, the, the trade-off between these two models helps you conjecture uh, reasonable properties that are true on real small models that also eliminate, uh, you know, weird spurious models. And, and that's how it's goal guided in that way. Right. That makes sense. Um, and it's not immediately clear to me that the move to the fixed points is completely necessary because if you're instantiating them at a meta program level anyway, um, the way you do it for the ISMT algorithm, why not start that instantiation from the least fixed point um, definition in the first place? Then instead of the um, if and only if definitions, you'd have if definitions. You might have a few more. Um, uh, you might have a few more uh, assumptions to start with, but at least you'll preserve the least fixed point semantics, to some extent, at least. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure that that's true. So um, I'm sorry. I'm also okay. just conjecturing. So please uh, go ahead. So so you're saying if you just had one way the implication, but not both ways, and you did the instance. No, yeah. So way, I'm, that's mostly just conjecture. But I'm saying if you start your um, unfolding from the least fixed point definition instead of uh, starting from the first order um, uh, abstraction, mm -hmm. uh, and since you're doing it at a meta program level anyway, uh, would that not help you avoid some of these issues? I see the confusion. So I think we have to kind of you have to kind of think of it as slightly backwards, right? Forget what the logic is, right? Just think about the instantiation, right? You're just taking the body of the definition and you're adding these bodies for specific terms and you're just right. do, doing it constantly. Now, it turns out that if you do this even infinitely, the most power it can go to is the fixed point abstraction. That's what the completeness theorem shows. So we're not really starting from, I mean, when I presented it, I presented it as, you know, you have this first order formula, you do it this way, but it's not really that, right? So you have this, the tools don't do it that way. In tools, when a user writes, they're writing it as though they have the least fixed point in their mind. The tool just takes these definitions and keeps instantiating them. It turns out that these instantiation have, are capped, their power is capped at the ceiling of the fixed point abstraction. 
So there's not, and, and in, in particular, if you take off the if and only if and you do only one side, it's even, you're saying even less, right? So you're not, you're not getting closer to the least fixed point. Uh, Another way to put this is that, you know, when you unfold definitions, uh, recursive definitions, you're really only looking at the if and only if kind of version of it. <coughs> even if, if only if the unfolding was correct. Um, so you're not really doing anything specific to least fixed point when you unfold definitions. So Leon, uh, Liquid Haskell, all of them unfold definitions, and it looks like it's something specific to least fixed points, but it's not actually. It's really only first order reasoning that they're doing. Nobody's doing LFP centric definitions unless you're doing real induction and you have a new inductive hypothesis that you do and you do that. There is no real induction going on in most of these proofs, right? Uh, the only magic that happens with induction is when a new uh, hypothesis is uh, given and then you prove that using induction. But the induction step again is done using first order logic. Right, okay. Uh, do, do you know if uh, uh, any of these tools employ something similar to avoid the um, rogue non-standard models as well? Um. Can take the sorry, uh, but you can. Uh, do you know if any of these tools also employ something similar to avoid um, RNMs? Uh, right. So the for like lemma synthesis, right? Uh, no, it, it, because as you said, the, uh, as uh, Professor Madhusudan said, uh, like uh, the definition unfolding in these tools is also doing the same sort of fixed point abstraction. Right. So they would maybe run into the same issues again. Yeah. So do you know if they employ something similar to avoid these problems? Oh, I see. Um, in in my limited no experience, uh, no, uh, they just fail, right? The user is left to handle the burden of figuring out why they failed and kind of magically come up with a lemma. There are tools that incorporate explicitly lemma synthesis into their framework, and those would overcome these spurious models by when they don't really look at the models, they'll just run into the problem and they'll conjecture that you need a lemma, they'll just start searching for a lemma. You have the SLS tool for uh, separation logic. So LSLS is songbird and lemma synthesis, right? That's separation logic. You have our tool, which is on first order logic with least fixed points. Um, there are lots and lots of tools for algebraic data types where they do lemma synthesis. Um, then there's a general purpose tool called Imandra, which employs a host of induction techniques and you know it just searches for crazy induction proofs and just tries to see if there's a lemma that way. Right? But they all, um, the, the ones that I know, they, they either just fail and require the user to give a lemma, or they explicitly try to overcome the being stuck by phrasing it as lemma synthesis. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> I think there's no other questions in the room. Thank you so okay. much. Uh, yeah, um, actually, I think we have only 20 minutes left in the session, right? Uh, yeah, I believe so. I believe it goes till 12.30. I think it's okay. So should do no. uh, yeah, so uh, I I would want to do a demo, but I think we should do a summary first. Um, no, I think you can do the demo. It's okay. Okay, yeah, okay. If we have time for the demo, let's actually... I just want to quickly show that we you know, have a tool because it's interesting. It's usable too. Right. Um, so I hope you're all able to see my screen. Uh, I've written. So uh, there's also a, we also have a front end uh, where you can actually write programs. Uh, this is not that. I am just showing it in a programmatic thing uh, to show that you can you know write your own. Uh, uh, you can write your own front end. It's really an intermediate language, and uh, this uh, just a wrap is at the logic level, and so it's very flexible. Um, I, can you please ask them to increase the font size? The font size. Yeah. Oh, font size. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Yes, uh, if that would work, um, that would be amazing. Yeah. Otherwise, um, we could all maybe scooch together a bit, a bit closer to no, the screen. No, I'm sorry. I can, I can let me try to increase the font size there. Um, I have to stop sharing. So. You. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's not what should happen. Okay, anyone see the mouse? Oh, there we go.
Uh, you've stopped sharing your screen. Is that yeah? Correct? I know. I, I had to. Okay, I took okay. off the bar in order to go to the. <laughs> okay, where I Change the font size. Yeah. Sorry. Just one second. Get much better. Okay. okay, I think uh, it should be good now. Let me share again. I is it better now, or would it like to be even bigger? Uh, I think it's good. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Right, so uh, this is uh, this tool is actually an implementation of the ISMT procedure for imperative programs, and also does the lemma synthesis that I uh, spoke about in these slides. Um, you know, you can it's a simple API wrapper around Z3, so you write formulas the same way you'd write it uh, for your uh, Z3 Python uh, API if you're familiar with that. Uh, but again, like I said, you can also write just plain text files. Um, you can define you know various constants x nil. You define functions. Uh, next previous these are pointers, and then you define recursively defined functions. Uh, here I have list, uh, doubly linked list, um, and those kinds of definitions. Then you just again write a VC using various operators, um, if then else implies um, conjunction, disjunction, whatnot. Uh, then you would uh, declare a solver object, um, just like uh, so. Again, this is we modeled a lot after the Z3 Python API. Um, and if you're familiar with that, uh, it should be uh, very easy to understand. Um, you just declare a solver object and you just uh, hand off your goal uh, formula, the property that you want to prove to the solver. Um, and of course, the solver knows that you've declared certain recursively defined functions. And the, the understanding is that this will check the validity using ISMT of the goal formula under the definitions um, by doing instantiation. Um, and of course, you can check whether you solved it or not. Um, I can just quickly try to run it um, at this point, just to show. So this is a very toy example I was showing, just to make it simple. Um, you can uh, see that if you just ask whether every doubly linked list is a list, this is actually not true. Uh, in first order logic, uh, you have a rogue non-standard model and you actually do need lemma synthesis to do it, right? So um, if you, if your solver says it's not true, you can call a lemma synthesis uh, routine. Um, I've called it solve problem here for the sake of the tutorial, but uh, there's a better name, in the actual documentation. And so you can, I want to show that this lemma synthesis is actually trying out various hypotheses. And it says, you know, this proposed lemma could, was not found to be a valid conjecture, and it uses certain count example models, it conjectures again. And then it eventually comes up with a lemma um, that you know this, uh, every doubly linked list is in fact a list, right? And it's able to show it, um, and it's able to prove the theorem once it when, once it figures out the lemma. Um, this is a, again a very toy example. Uh, we have more complex examples as well. So you have one with that relates a list, list segment, keys. Um, there's length and so on. And there you, you know, tries again various hypotheses and then comes up with a lemma where it says, um, if V1 to V2 is a list segment um, and you have a key in the keys of the, um, in, in the keys of the endpoint, then it also belongs to the keys of the, the head, right? So if you have a, a key in the keys of your tail, then you also have a key uh, in your own list. Right, so this is again. It has to relate. It has to conjecture this lemma based on relating various kinds of recursive definitions um, and using counter models to figure out what the relationship is between them. Um, so you, you can't. You, you don't need to just do it over lists. Uh, we can also do it over other more complex structures. This problem is actually fairly interesting. This is a, a real verification problem um, that comes up when you're verifying a binary search tree routine. And, and because it's not a toy example, as you can see, it's going through several rounds and trying various lemmas, increasingly complex, and of course, it's now found it. Um, so this problem uh, has many, it relates many functions, like 
um, min max binary search tree, the heaplet of the binary search tree, and so on. Right? So, um, and as you can see, it's fairly simple to use. You just declare your variables and your functions, you write your formulas with them, and then you just call a solver, and it's able to synthesize a lemma from there. And yeah, so um, the link to this is provided in the slides. We're going to put up the slides. So um, please use it for your, for your verification problems. Tell us what your experience is, and you know, we'd love to improve the tool with that. Can you describe the lemmas that you got there? Oh, um, yeah, can. So here, for example, um, the lemma that was eventually needed is that um, if you have an element v2 in your in the heaplet of a binary search tree rooted at v1, then v2 itself must be a binary search tree of its own. And v2 can be buried deep into the tree, but we know this. Um, but this is a property that requires induction, right? Uh, you can't just tell, because a binary search tree only says, I'm a binary search tree if my left and right are binary search trees and their keys are related in some way. But deep, very deep in the tree, you don't know whether that's a binary search tree and that requires an induction proof. Um, and this kind of lemma comes up all the time when you have to do any kind of binary search tree routine, right? You want to know that uh, some operation that you do in the middle of the tree does not affect the root of the tree. But along the way, it also came up with several other conjectures that were spurious, um, very weird ones like uh, um, if V1 is rooted, uh, is the root of a binary search tree, um, then it cannot be that V1 is contained in the binary search tree of V2 for any V2. Of course, it's not true. V2 can be above V1. Right? So it's trying out these various models where you know V1 and V2 are above each other, they're close to each other, far away from each other. And then, it's coming up with various conjectures and refuting them and eventually finding the right one. So, yeah. Okay, so any questions before I summarize? Any questions on the tutorial? There seem to be no questions in the room. OK. So let me quickly summarize. Um, so so what you've seen is this thrifty ISMT uh, method, which we advocate, is abstract your problem to first order logic with background theories. Choose a logic fragment that affords complete reasoning under certain thrifty instantiations. I, I think there are ways to do this for other logics. We have done it for uninterpreted foreground sort and for um, this uh, ADT sort, but I think there are other things to do as well. And then engineer tools to explore thrifty instantiation slowly. Um, and um, this seems to be a good tactic to uh, get over this, uh, what I consider one of the most important problems in verification, in automated verification at least. Um, so we saw these two logics. Uh, I won't go through them. Um, I want to quickly give some experience and open problems. I think lemma synthesis, which Aditya presented, is still an open problem, even though we have some tools to do it. Um, it is uh, it is a hard theorem, and I think it is uh, it won't scale for very large programs, uh, very large formulas. So, it is uh, it is an open problem to solve this well. Uh, we have a precise formulation of this problem. Uh, you can look at the paper, but. Um, um, and we have a CGIS, uh, you know, program synthesis like technique to find these lemmas, um, but still it's, uh, I think it's an open problem. Um, I think thriftier instantiation is a great open problem. The instantiations, even the ones we have, are expensive beyond level two of instantiation. Uh, sometimes even level two can blow up. Um, but uh, what we have done so far is apply the instantiation at the level of the program rather than compile the program to a, once you compile the program to a large VC, uh, after taking into account program semantics and so on, you'll get, I don't know, tens of thousands of lines of SMT. If you try to apply it there, it is unlikely to work. So what you have to do is look at the quantifiers really instantiated at the level of the program and instantiate them there, and then convert the whole thing to uh, SMT. So this is how our tools work. Like VC Dryad works on VCC, which is an, um, for C programs. It actually does the instantiation at the program level. But many instantiations are useless, and we, it's I think it's an open problem to figure out 
more clever ways of doing instantiation. In particular, resolution seems very related. Resolution by Robinson is actually a form of goal-driven instantiation. And the question is, can we use resolution? But this resolution is very different because it has to work with a background as SMT solvers and preserve completeness. So that's still a challenge problem. Our things do not work for arrays. Um, so arrays are notoriously hard because they are over background sorts of integers and a fragment one does not support that. Fragment two allows ADTs and you can model arrays using, let's say, functional lists uh, and then write recursive functions for reading and writing into arrays. But it's not a great tactic because I think even simple theorems like the axioms of um, uh, arrays are hard to prove. Using, you need many inductive lemmas to prove them. So I think arrays are still an open problem. The array property fragment, which is decidable, is actually, um, if you look underneath the hood, it actually does quantify instantiation. So maybe there are more um, fragments that can support arrays. Uh, separation logic, uh, the, uh, there's a burning question as to which separation logics can be converted to first order logic with recursive definitions where you, it falls within this fragment and you can utilize it. But separation logic actually has a fundamental problem in conversion to uh, first-order logic. So if you have alpha star beta and tails gamma star delta, uh, there is actually quantification on both sides. You have to split the heap into two parts on the left-hand side and split the heap into two parts on the right-hand side. And this actually causes quantification over sets, which one cannot support uh, using, um, because these are background sorts, sets, and uh, uh, we, we have no fragment that supports it. We have developed Dryad, which is a separation logic fragment, which can be supported. And Dryad gets away by having determined heaplets. So for any formula, there will be only one heaplet for it. Um, and uh, But it's slightly awkward. It's not in the you know, spirit of separation logic. So is there a natural separation logic that compiles into fragment one that we have is still an open problem and we have some ongoing work in this where it looks like you can build such separation logics. Um, there is also uh, functional programs have higher order functions uh, and they can also have co-inductive data types. And we, uh, we don't know whether our theorems can extend to it. So um, Leon, Haskell, Liquid Haskell, all of them support higher order functions, and they model it as uninterpreted functions. And currently, our completeness theorem does not hold for that. But we, uh, some preliminary work we have done, uh, ongoing work suggests that this in, this also may be true. That actually, even with higher order functions, we do get completeness um, of ISMT. So that's um, quite a new theorem because we I don't know any higher order logic that is complete, right, um, in any sense. So this would be an interesting theorem. But uh, co-inductive data types like streams, infinite streams, and so on are also interesting. And I, I don't know whether ISMT will work for them too. Um, and finally, distributed protocol verification. You know, distributed protocols require reasoning with quantified formulas. And they don't require least fixed point definition. So they actually first order. And uh, the question is, can we use thrifty ISMT-based techniques to do that? Um, IV is an example of uh, where it uh, explores decidable fragments of first order logic for verifying such systems. But our fragment one is actually much more powerful. It supports you know, background sorts like sets, integers, rationals, all kinds of things. And uh, it's undecidable, but it has an RD procedure. So whether fragment one can be used for actually distributed protocol verification, giving complete methods, um, and there's no gap here because there is no LFP definition is another interesting problem. So in summary, um, you know, we have this um, invitation to do this thrifty ISMT and um, we'll take questions in the next five minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there questions in person? There seem to be no in-person questions. Okay. Okay, so maybe we can conclude. Um, thank you so much. Um, and um, 
Yeah, so the, the references and the tool, are, uh, we'll post the slides, and uh, uh, they're on the slides. Thank you. Thanks, all, everyone. Thanks to the volunteers for helping us with the audio setup.